I will start the webinar now. We are 45 at the moment. Uh, I will wait a few minutes to see if more people can join. And then we can start. First of all, I want to welcome all of you to this uh, Anura 3D workshop. The program of the day is uh, what you can see here. We start with um, uh, five presentations of different authors that uh, will show applications of uh, Anura 3D. And then we, at um, one o'clock, uh, we will discuss uh, the new release of uh, Anura 3D and the um, uh, computational performance of the code, which is one of the aspects that we have been improving in the last year. Um, we will then stop for a break um, that is more or less lunchtime for people that are in Europe. And then we'll uh, proceed with uh, more presentation about uh, people using uh, or developing uh, the Anura 3D uh, code. We will uh, finally close with uh, some discussion and uh, you are welcome to provide suggestion or um, criticism of uh, the code is also fine. Uh, since uh, it's possible that um, people that are following this uh, webinar are not familiar with uh, NPM, I would like to start uh, providing you some basic concept of the material point method. Uh, MPM has been developed since the 90s in order to simulate large deformation problems. And in geomechanics, uh, uh, these large deformation problems can be found in uh, many cases, like landslides, uh, dam dikes, and levee collapses, in installation problems uh, such as uh, um, CPT or penetration of instrument uh, uh, or pile in the ground, and uh, of course, the stability of underground excavation. The material point method uses two levels of discretization. On one hand, the body is discretized with a cloud of material point, and this material point trace all the properties of the continuum, such as the mass, the velocity, acceleration, stresses, strain, the material parameter, and so on. On the other end, there is a background mesh, and this mesh uh, uh, covers the entire space where the body is expected to move, and it is uh, used to assemble and solve the governing equation of motion, but it does not store any permanent uh, information because everything is stored at the material point level. 
So at the beginning of each uh, time step, the information are uh, mapped from the material point to the node of the mesh. So we are basically building the governing equation of motion at the, go at the nodes of the mesh. We uh, solve the governing equation of motion and we find the solution at the nodal level. Then this solution is used to update all the quantities at the material point level, in including velocity and position. So we have that the material point will move through the mesh that remains fixed. So large deformations are simulated by material point moving through the mesh. Typically the mesh is fixed, but it can actually be changed any time we want during the simulation because it does not store any permanent information. MPM has some attractive feature. For, first of all, the, the um, structure is uh, relatively similar to FEM, which is a good advantage for developers because uh, people that are already familiar with FEM, which is very well established in uh, engineering, will, be, mm, will learn MPM in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, then it uses a Lagrangian formulation, and this is very convenient for history-dependent material like soil, and it is easy parallelizable, which uh, is useful to have uh, computationally efficient uh, software. MPM can be used for a lot of applications. One of the most used is probably slope uh, collapse. Many landslides have been um, investigated uh, with this code, co-seismic landslide, progressive failure, also including thermal effects, but also the application to levy and dump. Um, uh, this is the number of real landslides simulated with the MPM during uh, the uh, years from 2009 uh, to this year, which is not finished yet. Um, these are real case studies of landslide, so not uh, model slope or experimental cases, but uh, real full-scale examples. And as you can see, this number increased significantly in the last uh, 10 years. Moreover, if we want to check what are the codes used for these uh, uh, very complex applications, we can see that uh, Anura 3D is uh, basically the first one, although there are many other code that are uh, very well uh, developed. And in many cases, the researcher developed their own uh, in-house code. Other applications uh, are uh, mm, propagation of uh, granular flow and the um, impact uh, against uh, structures or the soil penetration problem, including uh, uh, shallow foundation, or piles, or uh, anchor pull out, and also erosion problems, uh, such as dam overflow, suffusion, tunnel gashing, and so on. Let's now move to the available NPM software and the Anura 3D community. We mentioned Anura 3D, which is an open source software, but actually it's not the only one. Here we have uh, a short list of the open source uh, MPM software that you can find uh, in the web. Uh, there are of course many others uh, uh, that maybe we are not aware of, but uh, these are those that has been used for geomechanical application. Some of them are very easy MATLAB or Python implementation, and these ones are very good to start uh, developing NPM because uh, the structure is very easy to, uh, to understand. <clears throat> Others are very advanced uh, Fortran or C++ code with um, many features and uh, um, performance uh, improvement that uh, can run uh, very efficiently. Anura 3D is uh, an open source code. You can find it in uh, GitHub uh, at this uh, link. And uh, it has been developed uh, over the years by the Anura 3D MPM community. That is uh, a group of uh, people, of researchers, belonging to different universities and research centers that uh, are working all together, focusing on the simulation of uh, soil water structure interaction problems. Uh, our um, application are mainly focused in uh, geomechanics. 
although the code can be also used for other purposes. We have a relatively large community of developers and users. The first line of code was written in 2008. And since the very beginning, the code was uh, 3D, implementing the dynamic equation of motion solved with uh, an explicit time integration scheme. Then it develops thanks to the contribution of many people who added several new features. And we had a great uh, um, contribution during the NPM dredge problem financed by the uh, European uh, Union. In 2016, we released our very first executable. And in 2021, the code became open source. We also organized an NPM conference in 2017 and a second one in 2019. Uh, now, as I told you, um, Anura 3D is a research, open source research code. And this means that uh, some of the functionalities are still under development or they are not fully tested for all possible application or they are not fully generalized. But our goal is to advance the state of the art in modeling large deformation and soil water structure interaction problems. The Anura 3D research community keeps developing new features uh, every year, and they will be added to the open source code uh, in the future. So if you, um, so we have the Anura 3D community that uh, is made of developers and users. Developers are the people that really write line of code or develop new features. The users are people that mainly uh, use or test the, um, the code. Um, there are people inside the community, but also outside of the community, meaning that uh, these are people that can uh, download or use the code that is in GitHub without a close collaboration with the people, with the core developer team of uh, Anura 3D. The core developer team coordinates the development and the new release. Um, so if you are a developer, of course, you can uh, create your own branch of Anura 3D, develop your own feature. And uh, if you want to include uh, your, um, your new development uh, in the open source uh, Anura 3D code, you can uh, get in contact with the core developer team and uh, we will uh, organize the um, steps necessary to uh, validate the implementation and uh, add it to the code. Then there are all the users that uh, are, of course, uh, people that only use Anura 3D for their application. And uh, this is a relatively large community. And if you are a user, you can uh, contribute by um, reporting new application, create new validation, but also finding bugs or suggesting new development of new features, uh, suggest improvement uh, and so on. Um, Anura 3D 2024 that we will launch uh, today uh, in a few hours um, can perform 3D and 2D simulation. Um, we have uh, explicit and uh, implicit time integration scheme. We have a different multi-phase formulation, one phase, two phase, uh, three phase for uh, dry soil, saturated and unsaturated soil. We have different type of boundary conditions and initial conditions. And um, what is new in this release uh, is that we implemented the stress initialization for fi from file. So the possibility to link Anura 3D with the other uh, softwares, I will explain you later. We have different computational methods and also other features like excavation, movie mesh, contact, algorithm. What is new in this release is the construction features that uh, allow you to um, add new material in, uh, in the model. So with this, uh, I um, hope you will uh, enjoy the workshop and please feel free to participate actively, ask questions, share your thoughts, 
And um, your involvement is key to making this available experience for everyone. As, um, you have a button to um, ask questions. You can do it at uh, any time. The moderator of the session will then uh, read it and uh, reply. Good. So thank you, everybody. And we can move with uh, uh, our first uh, speaker. <clears throat> The first speaker of uh, this session is uh, Matteo Zerbi, right? Yes. Good. And uh, your presentation is uh, Dry and Saturated Granular Mass Impact on Rigid Obstacle, Insight from NPM Analysis. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly, thanks. So good morning, I am Matteo Zerbi from Politecnico di Milano and uh, today I will present to you the work that we are developing in the Milan Research Group related to the impact of both dry and saturated granular masses against rigid obstacles. Flow-like landslides are a very dangerous phenomena since they involve huge masses high flow velocity, they travel long distances, and they are characterized from the absence of a precursor signal. In particular, during the whole landslide process, different regime transitions occur. Indeed, after the inception of the landslide mechanism, the granular mass stops to behave like a solid and starts to flow like a fluid, and remains in a fluid-like behavior during the whole propagation phase. But finally, when the mass arrest or impacts against something, a uh, different regime transition from fluid-like to solid-like um, regime occurs, and uh, we observe this change in the behavior of the granular mass. To study this kind of landslide processes, we need a particular numerical tool that must be able to account for large displacement and the occurrence of these regime transitions. For this reason, we decide to start to use the Anura 3D numerical code that is able to account for large displacement. And in particular, in this code, we have implemented a multi-phase, multi-regime model. Multi-phase, since it is able to account for the presence of both solid and liquid phase. And multi-regime, since it is particularly suitable to describe the behavior of granular material under both solid-like and fluid-like regimes and to describe the transitions between them. I do not have the time to enter in the details of this uh, constitutive model, but if you're interested on it, on it, you can follow this afternoon presentation of uh, Pietro Marveggio, or if you are not able to attend, you can check out our uh, latest paper published on uh, computer and geotechnics. So let's start with the application related to dry flow. And in particular, we decided to start with this application because this was already extensively studied with uh, them. And so we can compare NPM numerical results with those obtained with them. In particular, the input configuration that we chose is characterized by a uh, uniform uh, granular mass that is generated just behind the rigid obstacle, characterized by a uniform velocity and uh, porosity. The comparison between uh, NPM and them results uh, allow to state that the two numerical approaches agree in predicting the temporal evolution of the impact force on the wall. In particular, the two numerical approaches agree in predicting that as the velocity of the flow is increasing, and so as the impact energy is increasing, after the initial peak, we observe a strong reduction in the impact force until an almost nullification. And the two numerical approaches agree also in predicting the change in shape in the temporal evolution of the impact force due to a change in the initial porosity of the granular mass. And in particular, that if the, granular, the porosity of the granular mass is increased, this nullification of the impact force of, that occurs after the peak is not observed. All this phenomena can be uh, justified if the occurrence of regime transitions is discussed. 
And this is what we have done. In particular, I start with the case of a dense flow that is characterized by the nullification of the impact force after the peak. If we plot the ratio between the elastic energy and the kinetic fluctuating energy that has been used in literature to highlight the occurrence of regime transitions, indeed, when this ratio is sufficiently high, so when the prevailing storing mechanism of energy is elastic energy, the granular mass behaves like a solid, whereas when the main storing mechanism of energy is the kinetic fluctuating, the granular mass behaves like a fluid. The, the study of the, the spatial and temporal evolution of this ratio inside the granular mass allowed to justify the temporal evolution of the impact force in the light of regime transitions. Indeed, after the impact in the granular mass, we observe the propagation of a compression wave from the front to the tail that induces a solidification of the granular material and it is associated with the increase of the impact force. But after that, since the mass is not confined, we observe also the propagation of a rarefaction wave from the top to the bottom of the granular mass that instead induces a fluidization of the granular material. And this is the responsible for the almost nullification of the impact force. After that, what we observe is a progressive resolidification of the mass in front of the wall that is associated with a a subsequent increase of the of the impact force until the, the residual value. The impact mechanism is completely different if instead we consider a loose granular flow. In this case, we, what we observe is just a compaction of the granular mass uh, in front of the obstacle that is associated with a solidification of the granular material. So we do not observe the propagation of the rarefaction wave that we have discussed before. And this is reflected also in the temporal evolution of the impact force, because in this case, since the rarefaction wave is absent, we do not observe the nullification of the impact force after the peak, but what we observe is uh, just a slight decrease of the impact force until the, the residual value. Recently, we have started also to numerically simulate saturated granular flow. In particular, we have used the double point MPM formulation that is available in the Aurora 3D code that allow to model phase separation. So separation between the solid and the liquid. And in particular, the, analysis, the numerical analysis that we have performed have allowed that the presence of water significantly increased the flow mobility, and so the run-up height reached by the flow uh, behind the wall. And uh, have uh, also allowed to discuss the, the contribution of the solid and the liquid phase to the temporal evolution of the impact force. Particularly, the numerical analysis have allowed to discuss that the peak impact force is more or less the same in the dry and the saturated case considered. But uh, in, uh, whereas in the dry condition, the impact force was um, the only to the solid contribution, in the saturated case, this is partially that, uh, this is due partially to the fluid and to the solid phase. And in particular, if we discuss the temporal evolution of the solid contribution, what we have observed is that the dry case, after the peak, we observe the rarefaction and so the nullification of the force that we have already discussed. But when water is present, the solid contribution does not have this marked decrease. And this seems uh, due to the absence of the, the rarefaction wave due to, due to the low stress in the, in the solid phase. So I have concluded. Thank you for your attention. And I think that this work has allowed to demonstrate the potential of the numerical tool employed. So the code and uh, Ultra 3D with the constitutive model uh, implemented to advance our understanding of the processes occurring during dry, granular, dry and saturated granular masses impacting on rigid obstacles, but also to obtain a reliable prediction of uh, impact forces and the formation for uh, engineering purposes. So thank you for your attention and 
I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo. Um, Thanks, Matteo, for your presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions. There, but... um, there is a a there is a, a hand raised uh, by Federica Angela Mevoli. Uh, I will allow her to speak now. If you want Can to... you hear me? Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so I'm very new uh, to this topic uh, and uh, I'm very curious about something. Uh, with the saturated uh, media tool, uh, is it possible to model a uh, water body and to simulate uh, suspended particles movement? Thank you. In this case, we have used a constitutive model that is able to describe the behavioral granular material under both dense and uh, loose conditions, and so also granular media in which the, the presence of the solid phase is uh, very limited, and so is um, the behavior of a suspension. But take into account that we are using a continuum model, and so there are no particles uh, uh, suspended in the liquid. Okay. Probably the, the question uh, was uh, a little bit more uh, uh, regarding the code in general. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, on that, well, we can, I don't, I'm not sure if we have uh, uh, later uh, some uh, specific presentation, yet, but a lot of people have been working in the past uh, on erosion problems. So with, uh, yeah, uh, suspended particles uh, in a, in a, liquid uh, yeah let's fluid. say that under specific uh, simplifications <laughs> it can be done so it depends what are, what is the application you want to simulate we have to check let's say okay okay thank you thank you thank you um yeah probably no specific presentation today but uh, you can find them in the literature probably part of the community work on that so uh, you can start from what what has been done and then you can keep in touch uh, on the on our website we have a, a discussion section on github and you can start there a discussion and then probably you can get in touch with the uh, with um, people working on that Good. I think we can um, move forward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just to remind me, I mean, if you want, you can raise your hand or you can just type uh, uh, your question in the chat. Uh, then I think it's time to move to our next speaker. Uh, I'm glad to introduce our next speaker will be Professor Cuomo, who has been working uh, with, within the community for many years now, and is going to talk about um, uh, a possible mitigation on the impact of debris avalanches. So please, Sabatino, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you to everyone. I try to share my video. It's work. Okay. Uh... Okay, I will uh, shortly present you an application that is based on uh, experimental uh, uh, results and numerical modeling. The, the issue is that uh, debris avalanches, as you see in this picture, in this conceptual scheme, are a catastrophic uh, type of landslides. And uh, starting from a small volume of soil, then uh, often due to the impact on a stable soil, you can have uh, a uh, dramatic increase of the volume, a propagation uh, also with this uh, very typical uh, wedge-like triangular-like uh, 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 phenomena that are quite similar to snow avalanches in the literature are known as debris avalanche. Uh, now the geomechanical issues are that um, uh, the impact, the, layer here are partially saturated 
uh, the unstable mass here is nearly saturated or saturated. Uh, so you under easily understand that the dynamic uh, impact loading is quite complex mechanism, uh, including, of course, large deformation. Uh, so uh, if we try to give some uh, labels to this zone, one, two, three, four, from the top to the uh, to the to the pediment area, we have a different mechanism, dynamic impact loading. Then there is the truss of the stable material on the downslope, and also including a bad entrainment because you understand that when this material starts propagating, other material is entrained from the from the bed. The problem in practice, but also in theory, is that the, the extent of this zone is not known a priori. So numerical modeling can help us. If we go in the stress plane, we start more or less uh, from this point zero here. The, here we have the um, shear envelope, shear strength envelope. So we can have different scenarios. For instance, in the case of a drained uh, impact, we will have over the pressure, more or less constant, but the stress ratio increasing, and this is, of course, a problem. If the impact is fully unrained, you have forward pressure increasing and stress ratio much increasing. Uh, compared to the um, stress path typically induced by rainfall, we are quite different because uh, rainfall Induce stress pack like uh, the C1, where of course pore water pressure increase so much and stress ratio as well. So we are in the range of in this zone, uh, but uh, it's clear that the impact is in uh, in uh, really hydromechanical coupled condition occurring. So we need a very robust tool for uh, modeling this. Uh, MPM uh, in this case, uh, and uh, specifically the codes uh, developed by Anura over the years, it's uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, just uh, thank you, Francesca, for the very useful and nice introduction. So I want here just to focus that for this case, we will move to the Bishop uh, effective stress principles, where you see uh, clearly the saturation degree and the pore water pressure that is negative, we call uh, uh, suction this, and related to the pressure liquid, the saturation degree can uh... I cannot hear. Probably a network connection. Let's try mm -hmm. to wait a little bit uh, whether uh, Professor Cuomo can join back. Let's wait just a little bit. Otherwise, I think we can move uh, to the next speaker and then we can give uh, Professor Cuomo the opportunity to present later. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Probably it's a little bit longer than expected. Let's uh, yeah. let's move to the next presentation. Then we, at the end of this uh, first section, we'll uh, we'll have. Uh, so get back yeah. again. So well, uh, next speaker uh, should be Yi Pin Peng. Uh, yes, hello. Hi, hi. Thanks for for your for your uh, abstract. So, uh, your your wait, wait. Sabatino oh. is uh, oh. back. Okay. So, hello. 
Very interesting. Very Let's go back to okay. to Patino's presentation. Yeah. Sorry, but let's uh, okay. Let's continue for the moment. Uh, we were more or less here. I I think it was okay until here, right? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yeah. I think you were on the previous slide, the previous slide like when when we lost you you were on the previous one i think yeah, yes this one. one okay yeah. yes thank you um so i was telling uh saying that interesting people can refer to this to have more specific details now how roots come into the the game because uh if we introduce uh, we artificially um root a soil then we are able to modify the retention curve. So you can see here the non, especially if we do with the fine roots, fine long roots, then we can have that the vegetative species, uh, soil has uh, a different retention behavior and also a, an improved um, here uh, strength uh, capability. Uh, and uh, we can have also an initial condition in terms of a suction, higher suction, that is very beneficial. Uh, please refer to this paper for the, um, the details on the experimental uh, tests in the laboratory and in the field. So uh, if we start from the original situation, non-vegetated and non-vegetated, we move to this part, to this new scheme, where we assume to vegetate this part. Why this and not this one? For a number of practical and also uh, theoretical reasons, uh, because it's easier, for instance, to, to come to this place, this outcrop bedrock. Um, then if you reinforce this, you can have a, a global a, a worse uh, uh, behavior of the upper slope and so on. But please uh, go ahead and try to assume this as a reference scheme and uh, go to um, to explore a little bit the behavior of this new slope. Here you can have, for instance, uh, you, you can see the, the non-vegetated uh, properties uh, and the vegetated. Of course, we, we can have different options. And in fact, we test different species. Here you have some reference for three different. And of course, you could also try to have a different installation mode. For instance, all to vegetate all the slope, very long part, or a very small. That is uh, challenging, no? Try to, to inhibit or to mitigate this uh, catastrophic landslide with this uh, short installation mode. And uh, we will go uh, now to the results. This is the case zero. The, you can see here the cumulative electric strain. And you see how uh, this small mass is able to destabilize practically all this along the globe. If we go to some screenshot, we see that the deviatoric strains are propagating uh, downwards dramatically. Uh, and the, the, the true reason, the, or the, one of the main reasons is that you have the poor liquid pressure, poor water pressure increasing so much in this impact zone. Then, of course, you see also the capability of this uh, mechanical approach to, um, to simulate the, the, the dissipation of power depression. You have to go from this to this. Uh, keep in mind that here you have only three meters of, a, of, of soil. So we do not expect never and never this high level of pressure or liquid pressure in the field. And this is only the, uh, uh, this, uh, exclusively due to the impact. So this is the, the issue. How to mitigate? Well, um, you can see here the behavior of the vegetative slope under the same impact. What happens? The mechanics uh, is the same, but the outcome, the specific outcome, is quite different because First, the initial suction, this rooted zone is different because you have a different retention curve. Second, you have different permeability. Third, you have different shear strength envelope. So that uh, all these three new features combined together give it to you 
a maximum pore water pressure that is not anymore fixed but 35, and you have again the dissipation, everything is compatible with relatively small displacement in the impact zone. And this was the, the goal. Uh, and if we go uh, inside the, the now the model, and we the, we plot the pore water pressure towards the deviation of x strain, you can see that the peak pore water pressure in some specific point is not so different. The real difference is that the displacement are much more confined because of the new uh, shear envelope. And also the, the increase the stiffness because you can understand that if you intensely uh, permit a, a soil by fine roots, also the stiffness will increase. Not of orders of magnitude more, but for instance, just doubling uh, the stiffness, you have what? Uh, again, a reduced amount of displacement uh, in the interesting zone that is more or less this part here. Yeah? Uh, then um, uh, lower pore pressure are more or less similar in the in the uh, far from the, the impact. So, all in all, it works because you are reducing the displacement and you are reducing especially the maximum pore water pressure that is generated in the, in the here around point A and especially transferred to the lower uh, part. So you are practically inhibiting the transfer of big deformation and high water pressure to downslope. And this, uh, uh, if you uh, come back to this conceptual model, is exactly to inhibit the avalanche you know, the overall mechanism. Uh, further details are in this uh, paper recently at the online slides, some more reference, and uh, I have not specific uh, conclusion but uh, it's interesting, uh, uh, it was interesting for us to show this kind of application that is uh, quite new for this type of uh, um, pro like line slice. Thank you for your attention. Mm, thank you, thank you very much, Sabatino. Uh, I have a question because I got a bit lost, uh, I think, uh, because of the connection, but I couldn't understand very well how you simulated the vegetated soil. Is like into the constitutive model or uh, do you have a framework for uh, veget soil, vegetation, atmosphere interaction? Yeah, uh, yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, because I uh, saw this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, in both cases, the soil is uh, uh, simply um, modeled as more Coulomb frictional uh, behavior with a non-associative uh, zero de latency. Uh, okay. Tool. So it's a part yeah. of uh, soil with uh, improved uh, yes, exactly. material exactly. properties uh, thanks to the presence of the root. Yes. In okay. fact, an improvement is both in terms of a shear strength, of course, uh, but in terms of modification of retention behavior, you have more retention capability. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of initial condition, because you move from this uh, initial water pressure to an, uh, to an higher suction, so an, an improved and increased uh, 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 effective stress that is very beneficial in this, uh, in this type of a shallow soil uh, deposits context. Yeah, now I understand. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I can see another question. Professor Cuomo, thank you for your presentation. I have a small question. The failed area is not the root area. So this area is served as an obstacle or is it essentially to increase the frictional coefficient? This question, sorry, is from, okay. Manglu, but who is not yeah. Manglu? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, um, I the idea, the basic idea, is to have this rooted uh, soil as kind of uh, I don't know how to to to, to label because it's uh, not an obstacle because you see, but it's a a, a medium 
um, capable to absorb some kinetic energy, yeah, uh, but with a limited amount of displacement, yeah. So, for instance, some more details. Here you have a three meters of soil. Up, you can have up to two meters of uh, length of these roots. And this is, for instance, in this application, imagine that this is uh, 50, 60 meters. This is 15. Okay. The idea is to have a small rooted area capable to prevent uh, big uh, avalanches. Uh, and so you are indeed using the increased capability, the increased features of this soil. But both in, in as we were mentioning in the previous uh, answer, okay. Good. There is one more question: Is the failure mechanism of the lower slope due to impact force verified by field measurement or just a deduction? No, no. Uh, there are uh, indeed there are uh, evidence of of uh, either of uh, you know very strict correspondence uh, between this area and the uh, downslope areas so you clearly there is no there was a, a clear bedrock here but also there are other cases in, in which there were splash of this material on uh, on the slope and no debris avalanche occurred so also depending on the saturation degree on this slope, uh, you uh, you have in in, in the field uh, um, uh, both type of a response. Yeah? So that's why I was pointing out the the importance to have high suction in this potential impact area. That is one of the of the key of this type of possible mitigation strategy. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have no other question, so I think we can move forward. Thank you very much. Okay, next presentation is by Ji Ping Peng entitled yeah. Three-Dimensional Material Point Analysis of the Gangwa Landslide Constraint by Geomorphological Effects. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And I, Yipin Pen, I currently as a research assistant at National Taiwan University. And in this August, I will join Professor Kelly Yost's group at Penn State University to start my PhD study. And in this research, I continue my master's thesis to do simulation on real case Guanghua landslide to evaluate its kinetic behavior and the failure mechanism. So in this presentation, I will review some results of 2D analysis. And the reason why we think we need to conduct 3D analysis to see the geomorphological effect. So we start from the background information of Guanghua landslide. It is a river slope in situ in Taoyuan, Taiwan, and it has been moving more than 20 years. As you can see the digital animation model here, it's from 2011. It Oh, no, again. <laughs> there is a course on the on the speaker. Yeah. Doesn't work. But we we are maybe ready. we should uh, ask the speakers to switch off the video. Maybe yes. this will improve the but uh, I think she um, she knew to have some problem indeed. Uh, she sent us a um, record a recorded uh, presentation that I will now play for her. Okay, when uh, she will be back, she will probably be able to um, to um, answer question uh, and so on. Okay, good. So I will start. 
uh, such assistance at Let me know National Taiwan can University. And, hear. and in this August, I will join Professor Kelly Yoster's group at Penn State University to start my PhD study. In this research, I continue my master's thesis to do a material point and analysis of Guanghua landslide. So in this presentation, I will review some to the analysis of Guanghua landslide and uh, the reason why we need to conduct a 3D analysis. So we start from the background information of Guanghua landslide. Uh, this landslide is a river slope in situ in Taoyuan, Taiwan, and it has been moving more than 20 years. And you can see the digital animation model here from 2011. There was a subsidence on the upslope and the down slope there is an uplift. So at that time, we really try to figure out the value mechanism of these values in this landslide. But this down slope is too steep. So the people or the equipment we cannot access to do borehole data, borehole drilled. So we think that we can use to a um, material point method to use like 2D model to figure out the failure mechanism and uh, the soil distribution. And in this analysis, we can answer these four questions. First is the distribution of the shell formation at the down slope. And the second is the deep value surface, which was generated from the down slope to the up slope. And the third, the failure mechanism, because they are or two uh, so radio surface where I there are two federal surface generated so it's uh cause two different kind of value mechanism one is the shallow value and another is the disease value and it's also result in different uh, kinetic behavior as you can see here in the initial move there's only only the up slope start to move, but in the second slope, second stage, because of the generation of a shell band, the second part start to move, and the final these two soil mat merge together and moving. However, in this research, there are still some limitations because we only use one uh, one per section, one profile, so it actually cannot comprehensively show the Lens like behavior. This 2D model is more like to simulate like a typical a planner or a sacral model. But the Guanghua lens slide, which was highly, which is highly influenced by this two side topography, we call it geomorphological constant. And we think even though we can choose a multiple like cross section to do to the analysis, is still not enough. So we think we should use the 3D analysis. Uh, because it can only use one model to show to show this whole moving process, and also we can explore the geomorphological effects on this slope. Okay. This is the area we will model in. In three D uh, model for configurations, so we use AutoCAD to do to build the three D geometry and input to Git to set up all the soil parameters, boundary conditions, motor points, and the mesh. This is the soil uh, parameters we use. Uh, we use the saturated fully coupled to simulate the behavior of the corrobia layer and the fracture outer line. And integral outer line, we uh, assume it's a bedrock, so I will use a dry analysis. And because uh, we assume it's in the critical stages, so and also want to accelerate the failure process, so we increase the permeability. After modeling, uh, we use some in situ monitoring data to do validation. The first is in climeter to see the initial sliding surface depth, and second is digital animation model. Sure. Here, digital animation model. Uh, we have uh, two models. One is from March and uh, August in 2021. And in our 3D model, we can choose multiple different cross section of the 2D. So 2D, yeah, it's a slice 
to compare with the digital animation model, especially we hope we can simulate the deformation pattern of subsidence on the upslope and the uh, more uplift on the downslope. And then we choose two observed points. One is X meter, and another is the local role in situ on the slope to see the slope de surface deformation. And all the simulation results has good alignment with uh, monitoring data. So we could be using this model to see, to estimate the value mechanism and the kinetic behavior. We choose a, a one cross section of this 3D model to see the uh, value of surface generation, the different displacement and the velocity. And it's quite interesting that we can also observe the, in the first stage, the first shear band generator on the upslope. And the second stage, the second shear band generator from the toe to the top. And the final, these two, uh, surface merged together, so it's also induced the kinetic behavior initial only move on the upslope, and uh, at the second stage, the upslope and downslope with different velocity, and the final, these two soil mass moving together. And it can not only uh, Got the longitudinal uh, cross section. We can also have the lateral cross section. And in this is the derivatorical strain to see the value surface. Not only can we can see the two value surface generated, but also we can observe that the, the final stage on the down slope, there is a reverse incremental on the two sides with a side with the uh, bedrock which means that this soil mass is highly impacted from the uh, shear force from with the bedrock. And then we choose four points on the down slope. S1, S2 uh, are on the two sides, and S3 and S4 on the bottom, uh, which in front of the least soil mass. And we choose this four, three quantity to see the uh, change in strength and stress. Uh, we can start from the derivatorical strain. We can see the S1, S2 increase obviously, which means it's influenced by the shear force, just like the previous picture show. And the S3 and the S4 is highly impacted from the normal stress, which is um, generated from the soil mass because it moved to the S3 and the S4 and the squeeze this point. So this normal mode starts to increasing. Uh, this uh, change in stress stress, we derive that is can show that this slope will stop there is because of the geomorphological effect. Then this uh, final part, because of the time limitation, I cannot show more detailed and uh, like the uh, kinetic behavior of this landslide, but we will publish in a landslide journal in this year. So this is a conclusion part. I point to four, four points. One is, first one is, in both 2D and 3D analysis, we can also, we can see the two shear band generated in different time spans. And the second is, initially the movement only on the upslope, but as the second shear band generated and merged with the first one, the overall sliding behavior transitions into whole body movement. And the, the third is, by using this 3D MPM model, the sliding of the low slope of Guanghua generator stopped due to the geomorphological effect. And the final, uh, we can say using material point method using another 3D, yes, because another 3D can uh, effectively analyze the post value uh, large deformation behavior. And uh, also we can use the uh, uh, point analysis to see the change in stress, stress change to see the geomorphological effect. That's all. Thank you, everyone. And especially thank you for.
my uh, master thesis uh, advisor, Professor Young. Thank you so much. Good. I think it uh, worked, <laughs> even though we lost the speaker, but she is back, right? So good. Um, Thank you for the sorry good, connection. Good problem. I remember your presentation last year at the same <laughs> workshop yeah, for the two well. D uh, model. So I can see that you now step to three D, which is a good uh, improvement. <clears throat> there yeah. is a question in the in the chat, and uh, actually three questions. Question one: May I know how did you trigger the failure at the upper slope? Okay, uh, I directly, okay, um, because I assume that the slope is in critical state, so actually it's also the question three, I didn't simulate the initial suction, I use a fully saturated model to make it in a critical stage or to failure. So yeah, so it's actually triggered by the gravity. By gravity, okay. Uh, what is the reason for modeling shale using more Coulomb model in which normally is controlled by structural plane? Yes, sure. I sure change this word. It's actually the very, very, very the rock. So it's more like very highly, highly fractured layer. So actually we will call it fractural agilides. So I still use the molecular model because it's still the moving behavior is more like the soil mass. So that's why I didn't use like structure plan other like structure material. Yeah, and the third question I just entered, I didn't use initial suction. Okay. I just okay. use saturated. Yeah, perfect. I think it's clear. Thank you. Any other question? I don't see. There is one uh, in the chat. Uh-huh, yes. Uh, which is, yeah, you show that the, there was an impressive geometry which you prepared with uh, AutoCAD, but probably wanted a little bit of additional details. So mm, the, the question is about uh, which tool is used to build a complex 3D terrain. Okay, um, I initially I got the topographical contour by the digital animation model. And then I input to Autodesk, AutoCAD to build all the, may I have still maybe one minute I can share a, a present, a slice, more, could be more sure. uh, if you If you can share a slide, uh, it would be very nice. Okay, because yeah, 3D terrain is very complicated if we directly use GID from point to volume, it would be, yeah, take much more time. Uh, with a moment, I got to the... from here research so I think this one um sorry I forgot to share Can you yeah, see no. my now we see your screen yeah yes I imported the graphic the dwg file in git and this topographic contour is generated by, I think I use uh, ArcGIS um, or QGIS uh, also can work. Then generate the 10 meter uh, mesh, then review the contour surface by, uh, this is a common in Git. So we can direct got the, it's actually for the surface point about with the same interval. And then I only explore the point to the AutoCAD and using AutoCAD some command that the Jabra computer can build the 3D terrain. Then, as you know, uh, we have three 
so your layer, so each layer I need to address a little about the depth of the soil layer. Then the final will like this because we only we also needed a, to simulate the background mesh. Then final I will direct the also stabilize the IGS format and input the git in git to set up all the like parameters and the boundary condition. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your very nice uh, contribution uh, and also providing a few details on the on this part, which could be beneficial for everybody, I guess. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. So I don't see any other uh, question and I don't see any raised hand. So I think we can move to the next speaker, uh, which is Xiangyu uh, uh, Ma. And the title of his talk will be Numerical Analysis of a Soil Slope Stabilized with Piles Using MPM. Please, the stage Can is you yours. Can you hear me? Yeah, and we okay. see you also here. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Today, my present title is Numerical Analysis of a so slow with stabilizing power using motor point message. And my name is Xiang Yuma from Tongchi University. And my presentation is divided into four parts. The first is a background. As we know, the piles are widely used for slope stabilization. However, the failure of the pile so system is surely happened. Like the shear failure of the pile, the overturning of the pile, and the overall failure of the pile soil system and the plastic flow between the piles of the soil. However, current numerical studies mainly focus on stability analysis of pile soil system by FEM. However, the post failure behavior is seldom investigated. So this study aimed to investigate the large deformation of pile slope system after failure for supporting the risk-based design of slope stabilization. So this are the method and the mode and uh, we use we referring to the Tai and U guy mode. A uh, 3D slope with high power mode is simulated for high efficiency. And uh, the soil and the pile simulate with one phase solid dry water point. And uh, the soil pile properties as, as shown as the right table. Um, the failure is activated by weakening soil strength parameters. So let's talk about the modeling. Uh, to as we know, JIT has a very flexible way to mold to mold. So we can use the CAD JIT modeling for complicated slope pile system. Like in this condition, we in out CAD we draw our two D sketch and we extrude into a three D body and we use a module like intersection subtraction to build our pile shape. And we merge it like the final, like the final shape. And we generate the DXF file input JIT. And we, like, we can send materials, fixes, and meshing. So the final modeling is as shown as the right. We can see um, to, for high efficiency, the meshing is not refined very much. Uh, we just use the unstructured meshing strategy. So there are some assumption about the piles and the pile and the soil is uh, uh, the interface between the pile and the soil is really rough. So the deformation of soil and pile are consistent. So, so hence the contact is used here is non slip contact. So to investigate the different failure mode, we use the pile design scheme to change the pile, pile design parameters, include pile length, pile location, and the pile spacing ratio, referring to typical parametric analysis. So the pile location is just shown as left and in the slope toe, in the middle of slope, and then in the slope crest. Um, so before we give our result, we have a little comparison of MPM and FEM. Compare with uh, with FEM, the divitoric string and the critical slip surface, we can see they have a good agreement. And the average computation time of a neural 3D is eight hours. 
So let's talk about the results. The first is the failure mode of slow without a pile. We can say the plastic zone was developed at the toe of the slope and the shear band goes through the entire body. The depth of the slip surface is about four meters. And uh, then we change our pile location for three types. The first is the failure mode of slow with pile at the toe. When pile is short, we can see the shallow failure occurs in the middle and top of slope. After the soil behind the pile forms a shear zone or plastic zone, the soil is squeezed and slip over the top of the pile. We can see the runout is increased with pile length increasing and the over top sliding failure is intensified. It seems a little against our general sense. Like it, it should be the more pile length, the more safe the slope the slope is. But when the pile is failed to play a role in reinforcement, we can see the pile may disrupt the origin structure of the slope and may may leading a longer route. So when the pile spacing is small, we can see the lateral movement is constrained and the soil can only slide along the slope. When the pile spacing increasing, the lateral deformation becomes larger and in this time it is more called like a plastic floor and the overtop sliding failure is not obvious. So the second is the failure mode of slope with pile as a crest. As shown, sure, we can say when the pile has a crest and the pile is short, the deformation of the soil behind the pile is mitigated, but the soil in the front still has strong motivation to downward slide, so the separation is happened between the soil and the pile. We can see with pile length increasing, the deep failure is changed to local shallow failure. When pile is too long, it will aggravate the shallow slide, as mentioned above. So when the pile spacing is small, only the failure of the slope in the front is happened. But with the pile spacing increasing, the soil far from the pile side start to slide. That's called also called plastic flow between the piles is gradually intensified. And the last is the failure mode of slope with pile in the middle. In the middle, in this condition, the, the failure mode is all usually is small deformation. When pile is short, we can see the deep sliding belt goes through inter slope with local shallow failure. In this condition, the pile failed to reinforce to to stabilize the, the slope, so it's a mixed uh, uh, failure mode. When pile length increasing, we can see the deep sliding belt is cut off by the pile. But when the pile is too long, the local shallow failure is intensified again, as mentioned above. So when the pile spacing is small, only the crest of the slope have has a vast deformation and the soil in the front is stable. Well the pile with well with the pile spacing increasing, the arc arcing effect of the soil is weakened and the plastic flow is, is intensified. However, in this in some real condition, the wind pile in the middle it also cause some severe condition severe deformation like the overturn of the pile. The overturn of piles all usually occurs when the pile length is close to the potential depth of the sliding surface. We can see the deviatoric string at the different times as shown as right. We can see at first the soil movement uh, rotate the pile and the pile rotation aggravate aggravate the development of the plastic zone. The positive fading feedback may result in a wide range of the plastic area in front of the slope and a more serious consequence. So we also get have some sensitive analysis like the pair Pile design parameters. First is the pile location. We can see compare with other two locations. The, the displacement of pile in the middle is small. So the middle of slope is the optimum location for pile spa for pile stabilization. But the displacement of slope is sensitive to the change of pile location when pile is long enough. Because when pile is short, because when pile is short, the failure is usually the overall failure, and only when the pile is long enough, the change of failure mode 
can, can be significantly affected by the power ligation. So when, when the field modes change, the displacement is also changed significantly. So next is the influence of power lines. The displacement of the slope is decreased with power length increasing. We can see when power is too long, the severity of slope failure may be aggravated, especially when the power is failed to play a role in reinforcement. So we can see the displacement of the slope is not sensitive to the change of the power length when power spacing is wide, because in this condition, the failure mode is always is usually controlled by the plastic flow. So the last is the influence of power spacing. We can see the displacement of the slope is increased with power spacing increasing, and the displacement of slope is sensitive to the change of power spacing when power is short, because when power is long enough, the, the ability to cut off the slipping surface is well not um, or is not almost affected by the power spacing. Um, only when only only when power is short, the retaining effect of the power is uh, is almost uh, the arcing effect, which is controlled by the power spacing. We can see the wider power spacing over often caused the plastic flow and made the failure mode complex complicated. So we give a summary of the failure mode of soil pile system. We can see the pile as a tall crest is usually unreasonable, under which consequences usually dangerous. They have the maximum and the minimum risk. Um, pile in the middle slope usually has a good retaining effect. However, some design scheme may trigger serious consequences, like as uh, mentioned above, when the pile length is close to the potential sliding surf sliding surface. So the conclusion is we can say the existence of pile may aggravate the se severity of slope failure and lead to longer round distance. And when the pile is located near the slope tall, it's often difficult to reveal the retaining effect because it can cut off the slight slip surface and even cause further sliding after the slope failure. The change of the power length affects the evolution of slope failure mode and the power length design should be appropriate in case of aggravated shallow slide. And uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions now. Uh, but probably can I ask to Meres Jamei to raise his hand and then I can give him. I can the... allow him to speak. Yeah, because actually uh, the question is about, uh, well, we have a couple of questions. One is about how to model the pile in case of a, a PMP model. Uh, but I'm not sure if you mean MPM or so if... Okay, the pile um, in this way, uh, we you still use the, because in a finite element method, the pile usually modeled as a, a, a linear elastic. So in this condition, we also model the pile as a linear elastic. It's the same MPM mode. Yeah, okay. So um, then the second question is about, uh, uh, is, is asking if, if whether it's more convenient to use the coupling between MPM model and finite element model, especially in case of piles. Uh, so can you comment on potential coupling between the two methods? Uh, uh, coupling which method? Uh, FEM. FEM? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I can answer this because I don't, I think that uh, uh, Xiang Juma is more a user of Anura. And um, I think we talked about that uh, earlier, also with the, your co authors, Meng Lu. Um, it is possible, in principle, to couple NPM with the FEM. It is not ready for uh, Anura 3D yet, 
but uh, apparently there is um, there is some some ideas to work on this direction in the Anura 3D community. So maybe in future releases, we will uh, get that. OK, thank you. Yeah, I remember our talk a few months ago on this, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you, Francesca. <laughs> uh, we have another question. What is the density of material point uh, to, I think, of soil? To model flow in between piles, how many material point per element? Ah, oh, no, no, okay. So how many material point per element you used? Um, we use uh, um, for, um, about four material point, one element, like the typical tetrahedra element. Yeah. Poor material point per element, okay. Uh, but uh, since there is this question, maybe I want to add uh, that uh, in this uh, specific application, I think that uh, what is more important is the finite element discretization, because if you don't have enough element in, in uh, the space between the pile and the boundary, you won't get uh, movement because it is uh, locked by the boundary conditions. Um, so that is also important. So how many elements you have between the pile and the boundary? In the space, soil space uh, between the pile and the, and the boundary. Um, boundary? Yeah, well, you know, you have uh, uh, the pile and there is uh, some uh, soil space between the pile and the boundary of your model. How many elements do you have in that area? In the, um, one or, uh, or more than one? More, I think more than one. More than one, because with only one, I don't think you can get a good uh, uh, prediction of the movement. There should be mm -hmm. three or four, I think, at least. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, last question. Is there a contact model between pile and soil? No, and as we think they give an assumption because we think the deformation of the between the soil and the pile are consistent, especially when there are failure or inferior. So I think the relative displacement between the pile and the soil is really small. So in this condition, just use the auto auto non-slip contact. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. We have the last presentation of this uh, session, uh, and this is by Alex Semeninsky, and the title is Improve Neighbor Search Algorithm for Material Point Location in Element. This is a work that uh, Alex is doing for performance improvement of, uh, of the code that we will also talk later. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. That's good. Um, yeah, I don't know, for some reason, my surname in the, <laughs> uh, in the, uh, uh, view of all the member, um, participants is not really correct. So you see it now on the slides. I don't know how this happened, but well, yeah, I will talk a little bit about, um, yeah, the algorithm behind the neighbor searching, uh, basically used to identify where our material points are located. It is not included in the release that will be presented today. I hope to include it in the next release. So little motivation uh, is why do we need even this? So what we need during the computation is actually in each computational step and in each increment two things. We need to identify which nodes uh, are transmit transmitting information to a material point and the vice versa which information uh, uh, to which nodes the material point contributes. So in the case of linear shape function, it is actually sufficient to answer just in which element the material point is located, because basically the nodes of the element where the material point is located are exactly the nodes with whom the material point and the nodes are exchanging information. Just a little, um, a little uh, example that it's not always the case if you're not using linear shape functions. So for example, here, that's for quadratic uh, B-splines where the shape function 
uh, area of influence or like the compact support of the shape function is larger than just the neighboring uh, or just like one element. We need not only to know in which element exactly the material point is located, but also where in the element it is located. This is something we see here on the right side. So basically there are subdivisions of elements and depending on if we are in the upper quarter of an element or in the lower quarter of an element, we have different nodes that contributes and in interacting with the element. So here, when we are not with linear shape, dealing with not linear shape functions, but like shape functions with larger complex support, this is not applicable or we need to do something else. This is also what I've done in this publication that I mentioned, but let's go back to linear shape functions. So what is the uh, problem with finding out where they're located? Well, it is really easy if we have structured meshes to figure out uh, in which element the material point is currently located. It is way more complicated if our meshes are unstructured. And depending on the number of nodes, elements, material points, and time steps, so basically on the size of our model and how many times or how small our increments are that we are using, uh, it can take really a long time to identify where each material point is located. So as I mentioned on structured grids, this is kind of a nice, uh, uh, easy problem. So here we have uh, basically a really nice structured grid with uh, um, square shaped elements. And if we have a equidistant spacing, it is quite easy just by dividing the coordinates, basically the X and Y coordinates by the spacing, we can easily identify in which column and in which row the material point is located. And as we have the connectivity list, we can directly um, yeah, identify in which element our material point is located. And we have also, as we are using the linear shape functions, directly the nodes, which coming also from the connectivity list. This is really good because such a case can be vectorized. So basically we can create a list of all coordinates of all material points and divide each entry of this list by the equidistant spacing and basically get out a new list, which tells us though each material point in which row and column. So this can be easily parallelized. This is also the case when you're using vectorization, when you're just formulating this as a vector operation in Fortran, in MATLAB, and any other programming la language, mostly such operations are already parallelized and are extremely efficient. So this is the desired way. If you have the opportunity to use a structured mesh, always go for a structured mesh because you will always gain a lot of efficiency. So let's have a look at triangular elements. So for example, when we moving now a material point, as we see down there from one element to another, there are several methods how we can identify it. So now we cannot just divide by the spacing because basically we have a diagonal um, separation in the elements and we would know in which column and which row it is. We will come now to this a little bit later, but it's, we won't do. Uh, we won't know exactly if now, for example, the element, uh, the material point is located in element one or two. We will have the box. So normally, when we would now identify in which element the material point is located, we would have to check each element, and there is like a method which, based on the barycentric coordinate system, basically we have uh, connecting vectors between the nodes and the material point, and we're making dot products to see on which side of each edge the material point is located until we will identify it. If it's a really large model and we have to go through each element, through each edge and create those kind of dot products, it is extremely expensive. Therefore, a common method also implemented in Anura is the bounding boxes method. The bounding boxes method is basically using the maximum and minimum X and Y and Z and 3D coordinates of an element, creating a box that completely uh, contains the element and first checks if the material point is within such box. If the material point is within such box, then it continues uh, verifying it through iterations. If it's really in this element or if maybe another element also is partially in the same bounding box 
and the material point might be in the bounding box, uh, might be located in the other element. Another point is also we could use velocity estimation. Basically, if we calculate the velocity, we could see where the material point goes and estimate more or less where to look for it and not consider the other elements. So it's always going about reducing the amount of elements we have to look at to find where the material point is located. So what I want to present today is basically space partitioning. It is quite related also to the bounding box uh, thing, but it's uh, a little bit, I would say, even easier to implement, and in some cases, more efficient. Um, it is using an accelerative grid, which then can basically, again, take advantage of vectorization and be extremely efficient. So how does it look? We look at the same two-dimensional mesh, and basically, we define an auxiliary grid that is now, again, with our rectangular elements or like auxiliary uh, elements that we have. And once we, again, applying the same methodology like I explained before, we at least know, OK, it's, for example, the material point is in the cell 22. And we keeping another list that is initialized in the beginning of the step where we know cell 22 contains two elements. And we have the IDs, so we have only to look in two elements instead of looking through the whole mesh. Well, this is if it's an equidistant grid. What if the grid is a little bit more complicated? So here we have like a refinement in the middle, and we have larger elements outside, and basically the material point moves through the grid. And um, how would we proceed with the same methodology here? Well, first, we would have again an auxiliary grid outside to locate the in which of these bigger patterns, these bigger patches, the material point is located. And then we can repeat basically the same methodology. We can go into the sub mesh, uh, as I call it here, and divide it again in auxiliary grids and then locate it in the same manner as I said before. So where does it work? So like for semi-structured meshes, spacing partitioning can be used with vectorization on submeshes with different spacings for X, Y, and Z, if we are in three, uh, three dimension, uh, dimensions. The limitations are for unstructured mesh. Well, we can think if we have such a mesh uh, to define an auxiliary mesh that is axis aligned, and that's basically the requirement that we need for, for this methodology, is a little bit difficult. We can make it on some parts, on the other parts, it will become quite impossible, like we see here for element three and four. So in three dimensions, it becomes even more complicated. So when we have a material point moving through tetrahedral elements like we have uh, implemented in Anura 3D, it becomes definitely not easier. But still, if our three-dimensional mesh is equidistant in each direction, we can use such cells, or unfortunately, this red cell moved a little bit. Uh, it should be actually aligned with the uh, with the grid. Um, we can use actually the same methodology and identify in which row, column, and like depths, like the other row, uh, the material point is located. And then we have just like some elements, in this case, the blue, the red, and the green one, and some more maybe, it depends on the discretization which we have to check for and not the entire mesh. Well, that's the summary of it is basically that space partitioning can increase the computational efficiency by reducing the number of elements that needs to be checked. As I said, the larger the model, the more it affects the computational time. For smaller models, you won't see a difference. For smaller models, indeed, you can check all the elements. And when you have a really coarse grid, you won't see a lot of benefits from the methodology. It's really when you have a lot, a lot of material points, a lot of nodes, a lot of elements, it becomes really powerful. So the method can mainly be applied to access aligned patterns. So we have like, if our mesh has kind of access aligned patterns, where else the patches themselves can be arbitrary unstructured, we can already apply it and reduce the computational time that we need for it. As I mentioned, for larger model, the larger the model, the more effective it is. And yeah, finally, uh, we have, I'm planning to implement it for the next release. So not this release that we will see today, but the next one I'm planning to implement it. And maybe also combine with the bounding box methodology because actually they're quite similar and can be combined really well. Thank you.
Thanks, Alexander, for your very nice presentation. And uh, hopefully, this part will be included in the next release. Uh, I don't see raised hands or question. Maybe we can move. We can probably move to, well, we can close this uh, first uh, section here. And then we can move to <laughs> the launch of the new release. The time everybody was uh, <laughs> Thanks waiting for, for all the speakers, by the way, for contributing. Thank you so much. Good, good. Um, thank you, thank you, everybody. So now there is a short uh, slot where um, we will present uh, very shortly the new Anura 3D release. And the second presentation is uh, about uh, performance, uh, computational performance of uh, Anura 3D. So I will uh, start sharing my screen. Give me a second. Okay. I think you can now share my screen. So on behalf of all the Anura 3D community and Anura 3D developers, uh, we want to present now the new release uh, Anura 3D 2024. The new version of the code uh, can do as I said before, 3D and 3D uh, analysis. We can have explicit and implicit time integration scheme with different constitutive model. Uh, we have default one like linear elastic, more Coulomb, Bingham that uh, are available in the code directly, but you can uh, implement your own one and add it to the code. We have uh, different multi-phase formulation, one phase, two phase, and three phase for a dry, saturated, and the unsaturated soil. We have different type of boundary and initial condition. And with this respect, we have uh, a new uh, feature that allow you to initialize the stresses at the material point level, um, reading from a file that can be created uh, from an output of another program, for example. Um, we have different computational method, MPM, but also updated Lagrangian FEM and FEM. We also have other features like contact algorithm, moving max, moving, moving mesh, excavation, rigid bodied. And now what is new is that we can do uh, both excavation and construction phases. And during this year, we have been working on performance improvement. And now the code can be compiled in Linux and in Windows. And uh, we try to improve the computational uh, efficiency. So now let me briefly explain you um, what is the stress initialization from file feature. Uh, this feature, I think it's really useful for uh, those problems that have a large uh, um, time before uh, seeing uh, large deformation. For example, for slope stability and um, landslide, because uh, in many cases, the triggering or initialization phase uh, of the landslide is uh, very, very long. It can take uh, several hours or days or even years. And during this phase, uh, the displacement are very small. So there isn't really the need to use uh, MPM that is optimal for large deformation. So for example, for this phase, you can um, calculate uh, the stress distribution, pore pressure, effective stresses with the finite element, for example. And, um, and then when you are close to failure, you can take the stress distribution um, and um, give it to as an initial stress state uh, to Anura 3D to um, uh, perform only the large deformation analysis in MPM. So to simulate the post failure stage. What you can see here 
is an example of a slope that failed because of rainfall infiltration. The triggering phase uh, took the, um, several hours, while the failure is only a few seconds. So the entire simulation with Anura 3D is uh, inefficient, and you can do the pre-failure stage with an FEM, for example, very basic um, uh, commercial software. And then uh, when you are close to failure, go to NPM to simulate uh, only the run out, so the post-failure stage. And this coupling is uh, very efficient. How can you do this uh, stress initialization from file? You can select the appropriate uh, um, uh, feature in the uh, in GID in the input interface, and uh, you need to prepare a text file and save it uh, with uh, a name that is the project name dot mapf, and this file must contain the uh, value of stresses at specific point uh, with the coordinate that are given, and then a parameter that is called the smooth length. This parameter should somehow represent the distance between points where you know the stresses. Uh, if some points are very close to each other and other are um, far from each other, you have to um, find a representative value that uh, you typically is close to the smaller uh, distance between uh, um, known points. Um, this is the stress initialization from file. The, uh, the other feature that is new is the construction feature. And uh, in this, um, with this feature, you can uh, add material point in specific volumes of uh, your model at specific steps of your uh, simulation. Uh, for example, <clears throat> The uh, green um, element is filled from step one, the yellow one from step uh, three, and, and so on. So this is allow you to simulate uh, the construction. If you have gravity, uh, clearly the um, application of gravity, if the material is uh, soft, will um, generate some settlement and part of this volume might get uh, empty because of the settlement of the material. But if you really want to keep it um, fully filled by material point, you can activate this option uh, fill empty elements. This is close to what you want to reach when you build, for example, embankment, when even if soil settle, you will keep adding material to, to reach a specific uh, um, elevation. Uh, about performance improvement, uh, there will be a presentation uh, by Matteo Maglia uh, after, after this one. Um, I would then try to give you a very short introduction on how you can perform a simulation in Anura 3D. <clears throat> First of all, you should download the code. The code is in GTAP. Uh, you can find it at this link. At this link, you will find a folder called uh, uh, SRC, which is uh, that contains the source code. When you download, the source code, you get uh, all the uh, file where that are used to um, build the executable. The programming language is uh, Fortran, and uh, you need uh, to compile it uh, using Visual Studio and the Intel uh, Fortran compiler. When you build this model, you generate an executable that will be called Anura 3D 2024. And, um, and it's the, uh, the executable that will uh, run your uh, simulation. In the Anura 3D pack, you will also find a problem type uh, that is uh, specific for Anura 3D. And is, this is a set of files that you can use the, in the pre-processing phase with uh, the software GID to generate the input data for the Anura 3D uh, calculation, as I show you in the next slide. So performing a numerical simulation consists of uh, three parts. First, there is the pre-processing phase that uh, allow you to create the input data. This can be done with the GID preprocessor. However, I have to say that the uh, text file used by Anura 3D 
the CPS and the GOM file are fully open. So you can also generate them with your uh, own uh, software, I don't know, MATLAB or uh, what else you want to, uh, to use. But we uh, suggest to use GID. The second phase is the calculation phase in which you perform the calculation with the Anura 3D software. And finally, you have the post-processing phase that consists in the, in the visualization of the result. And here we have two options, ParaView or JD. So regarding the pre-processing, uh, the Anura 3D problem type uh, is given together with the source code. And this uh, has to be uh, included in the um, GID problem type uh, folder. Uh, so that when you open uh, GID, you can select uh, data, problem type, and select Anura 3D 2024. So in this way, you will get uh, a very nice uh, interface, uh, easy to use, that uh, will allow you to uh, define uh, materials, uh, parameter, material point specification, all the boundary and the initial condition, contact problem, the contact properties, and so on, and also the uh, calculation data. You can then generate the mesh and so on. When your model is ready, uh, then you can uh, um, generate the input file. And this uh, going to Anura 3D and generate Anura 3D file. This uh, input file are the GOM file uh, that uh, describe the geometry of the problem and all the information regarding dimension, computational mesh, material data, initial and boundary condition, and the CPS file in which uh, um, the calculation data are specified in terms of number and duration of the load step, load type, multipliers, and so on. The calculation can be run from the project folder in which are included the material, uh, in which is included the executable, Anura 3D Exe. Uh, just clicking in, um, double click on the calculate uh, dot bat. Um, you can also run the, um, the code using the Windows uh, command prompt. <clears throat> when you get uh, the result, these are in uh, ParaView, for example, uh, because we store them as a VTK file. So you can download ParaView and uh, open the file. Um, the VTK file are organized in this way. Uh, there is a set of uh, information uh, called mesh data, and these store all the information regarding the mesh, so the position of the element, if they are empty or uh, active, and so on. Then all the quantities that are scalar, for example, mean effective stress, pore pressure, material ID, and so on. Uh, we have then all the quantities that are vectors, for example, displacement and velocities and all the quantities that are tensors, for example, stresses and strain. Then you have three uh, digits that are the number of calculation steps. So you will get 001, for example, for the first load step, and then another six digit for the time step. Um, in addition to the ParaView uh, VTK file, we have uh, also text files, for example, PAR file that ANG and MLG that store several other information regarding your uh, simulation. And uh, you, if you select it to have uh, output also in GID, it will, uh, the code will generate a binary format uh, file that can be open with uh, GID. So this is an alternative uh, possibility to visualize the, the result. Um, I remind you that uh, uh, we have uh, some uh, supplementary material and uh, documentation in our website. If you go to the wiki uh, page, uh, you can find uh, um, the documentation, so our uh, manuals and also news and events and uh, 
uh, references uh, and a lot of other material. We also have a discussion session where you can post your question and um, other users or developers can uh, uh, try and answer this uh, question. Um, this is all. So I thank you for uh, your attention and uh, I hope you will be able to use or try the code for uh, your application. Of course, we are here to support you and uh, eventually also establish long-term uh, collaboration within uh, institutions. Thank you very much. We probably have some question. Give me a second. We try to answer. Uh, is it possible to share the presentation? Actually, this meeting is recorded and we will share the recording for sure. You will find the link uh, in the website and I will uh, also put uh, the video in YouTube. Okay, uh, question. One, so this, are, are there any restriction on the construction feature such as a single or double point when adding material? I think that Gaia, you can answer this. Uh, yes, the implementation of the construction features, now it's only for the single point formulation of MPM. And um, uh, you can specify the number of um, material points per element as you do when you create your model, but not the total number of uh, material points that you want to add. And it will be depending on, um, on the deformation also of the, of the soil. Pietro, do you want to add something? No. Uh, well, on, on this side? Uh, no, no, because I uh, just uh, right, read here, uh, that Pietro want to answer this oh, question. But I, it was I was case. recording the, the answer. Ah, uh -huh, okay, okay, great. So, um, live response. No, no, perfect, great. Um, hello, developer. Can you record a video on how to use Visual Studio 2022 to run Anura 3D code for computation? This is a good question. We do have some tutorials and you can uh, watch them in uh, YouTube, in our YouTube page. Uh, the problem is that uh, those tutorials were created with the older version of the code. Most of the steps are still valid for the new version. And I think that uh, if you watch those videos, it will be somehow easy to do simulation with the 2024 version, I think. Um, then, uh, okay. Uh, compilation under Linux, uh, is it uh, cross compilation from Visual Studio or also native under Linux? Pietro, you are the expert here. <laughs> yeah, you, you can compile it. Uh, uh... The Linux, uh, we did not include, uh, let's say, a detailed description in the in the manual for now for this for this release, but uh, we did it, so it is possible. Uh, I think that uh, we may consider adding uh, a section on the forum how to explaining how to do it, uh, or well, all the files are there, so you can you can try you can try or, or ask in the forum and then probably will uh, we will uh, give you the a detailed uh, answer let's say yeah thanks uh, how do you apply velocity or acceleration for a seismic load uh, there are several people that did this application in the anura 3d community uh, for sure one is gaia who is here the other two uh, Abdel and uh, Alba are not here. So, um, yeah. Yes, more or less the implementation of the velocity uh, to simulate the seismic load, um, it's done by uh, specify the velocity uh, time or acceleration time history. Uh, included in a, in a text file, for example, that the code can uh, can read. And this velocity could be applied as a prescribed velocity on the nodes 
or on the material points. Uh, at the moment, I guess that the, in the interface of Anura 3D, you only can apply a constant velocity on material points or not. So uh, this is a this will be an extension of this functionality, but uh, uh, I think that for the next release we will also update the the GID interface to to allow the this feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then okay. Do I need to install the old version before installing new version or just replacing the executable file after compiling? Do you have tutorial using UMAT in Anura 3D? Okay, so when you start using the new version of Anura 3D, you start uh, with directly with the new version. You don't uh, absolutely need uh, the old one and uh, you will also might have trouble in uh, running uh, all their input file with uh, the new code so just uh, start from scratch with uh, the new code um Pietro, do we have tutorial for the um, new material uh, yeah, model maybe, in... it's, maybe it's better to address a little bit this point because there is a change yeah. with respect to the previous version instead we are not using any more dlls for constitutive models, uh, but then the, the main reason is uh, to, let's say, to be more easily compatible with the Linux, uh, uh, Linux environment. So this is also linked to the previous question. Uh, so now all the models are included, embedded in the code. So you have to compile the, the whole code, but every, everything will be just in the executable. So this is uh, for, uh, uh, I mean, people who's already familiar with Anura 3D, of course, you can still go on with the previous version without uh, without issues. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite easy now to include uh, everything inside the code. Uh, there is a, there is a, uh, it is briefly explained in the tutorial as well how to how to include an external soil model starting from a UMAT file in the code. Should be in chapter five. Uh, but then again, uh, you can uh, go back to the forum. Yeah. <clears throat> you have specific issues. Uh, I can probably go on also with the following question. Yeah. Uh, we are not offering a, sp uh, a full support on uh, using MPI or OpenMP. We are working on the on it. Probably for the next release, uh, we hopefully for the next release, uh, we will include that uh, in our uh, official release. Uh, if you are interested in, in collaborating with the, with the group, uh, so getting to say preparing the new release, uh, well, your help uh, will be much appreciated. So, well, if you want, you can just join our, our group. Uh, but yeah, we are working on that, but no official uh, support uh, in, the, in the releasing it up to now, because we want, of course, to test a little bit uh, uh, our version before uh, going with, uh, with the official release. There is another question on you, Matt, but I think you already answered on that, right? Yeah, maybe I'll go a little bit more specific. Uh, we are using you, Matt. Uh, since we 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 can't we can't use a VUMAT version because we need the uh, basically you need well you can you can use it but you have to modify it a little bit it's easier with a UMAT with a UMAT uh, definition since we are using the stiffness matrix to basically to define uh, the wave speed uh, velocity and so estimating uh, the the current number. So yeah, UMAT, UMAT um, format will be the official one suggested, let's say. Yeah, good. Okay, finally. Is, uh... mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, okay, the, okay, there is a very specific question, but this I suggest to post in the forum. What would be the step if I want to separate dry soil and saturated soil? Uh, this very specific problem maybe we can address in the discussion forum. Yeah. So I want to close this part there with the also another one in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, go, go. Yeah. Ah, in the chat, uh, yes. Yeah. 
is it possible to conduct two-phase two-point format MPM analysis? Uh, yes, this could be an option. So, yeah, of course, uh, it has advantages, uh, can be a little bit more um, computational demanding, but yes, it, is it possible? And quadratic elements, uh, not in this release, actually. Uh, they will be available, uh, again, hopefully. We are, I mean, part of uh, the community is working on that. So <clears throat> I think that... Uh, as far as I know, uh, quadratic elements are basically ready, but we are doing some further testing, Yeah. Uh, which we weren't able to finish uh, on time for this release. But... Uh, I think they will be in the next one. OK. So I think we can close. But before, I want to say that uh, Nuria Pignoli is reminding us that the 3rd of July, there is an online GID convention from in the afternoon um, Central European time where the new capabilities of GID will be announced. So this is probably very useful for uh, all the users of uh, Anura, but and uh, of GID in general. OK, great. Um, so now we have a last presentation before lunch. Matteo Maglia that will uh, talk about the current state and computational performance of Anura 3D, an overview. Yes, do you hear me? I, we can hear you. We don't see um... your screen if you want to share. Mm -hmm. And do you see my screen now? Yep. We can see the presenter mode. The other screen, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's okay? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Matteo Maglia. I am part of the Anura 3D developers team, and I'm going to present an overview code current structure and state and give some insight on its computational performance. This could be interesting for those users that are thinking about starting developing new features or modifying existing ones. After highlighting the code main properties and structure, the general NPM calculation procedure will be related with the code main modules and subroutine. And finally, a view of its computational cost will be presented along with the new release improvements and expected future ones that we have started to see. All the source files of the new release can be downloaded directly from our GitHub page and then compiled with the Intel One API compiler. These source files are programmed in Fortran and it runs in a sequential way. Let's now focus on code structure. When opening the solution and go inside the source files, they are organized in seven folders and two main files, the Anura 3T and the kernel. In these folders, the modules are organized by groups that relate to a same code function or part. First of all, the folder called FAM modules has all the modules that are equal to the finite element method analysis, such as the elastic stiffness or B matrix calculation, specific subroutines for evaluating different types of elements, calculation stresses and strains in integration points, and information about the mesh. The input modules folder has the modules related to the reading of files determining the calculation geometry and material data, as well as information generated from previous calculation stages. The folder material models has the three basic soil models included in Anura 3D, file to use soil models defined by the user, and to model liquid in one phase. 
The main modules regarding the material point method itself are located in the MPM modules folder. They account for particle discretization formulation needed for two-phase or three-phase materials, Lagrangian and convective phase, contact formulation, moving mesh, and rigid body algorithm. In the output modules, we can find all the files needed to write results for post-process or for files needed in next phases. The shared folder has subroutines such as initialization of kernel data on screen or giving errors or warnings to the user. The last folder has a direct spur solver and it can be easily extended to incorporate other solvers. Finally, we have the two main files of the code that are the annual 3D and the kernel. And now I will show you the kernel structure and functions in more detail. File sections are defined inside the kernel. First of all, the code is initialized with the definition of the calculation parameters. They are read from the CPS file and organized in the calculation parameters global array. In second phase place, the element type is defined, selecting between triangle or tetradic elements for the moment. After that, the material types and properties are transferred from the COM file to the material parameters global array. And finally, all the text outputs files are created. In second place, the mesh is initialized creating all the necessary information, such as shape functions and element adjacencies. All the mesh-related information are then read from the COM file and transferred to the geometric parameters global array. This is the case of the contact formulation or the absorbing boundary, for example. Then the nodal array's velocity and accelerated, have accelerated and acceleration are allocated depending on the formulation defined. Finally, if it is necessary to use information from previous load state, it is read from the result files. An example of this is the reading of the new nodes coordinate if the moving mesh is being used. When the mesh is correctly defined, it's time to allocate the material points and its properties. The particles global array is filled for each material point ID with all the information needed. In this stage, for example, global coordinates are set and prescribed velocity on material points is set to 0, 1 for each particle if it is defined. After this step, material points are related with its entity and material. In this section, if an initialization procedure is chosen, it is applied. This can be the case of the k not procedure and the import of stress initial configuration from an external file. Finally, surface reactions are determined and the output file is generated. After the three initialization sections are executed, the load phase can start. It has the iteration loop itself, which runs until convergence is achieved and the results writing. After writing initial information in the output file, multipliers for velocity, load gravity, and updated from the calculation parameters array and displacement are reset if defined. Then the critical time step is computed. And after the construction excavation is considered if applies, the running of dynamic load step starts. When it ends, the results are written. After finishing a load phase, pointers, allocated vectors, mesh information, and temporal information are destroyed. Now let's take a closer look to the calculation procedure inside the time step or iteration loop. The process can be divided in three phases, the initialization, the Lagrangian, and the convective phase. After them, results are written and cycle starts again if computation is not ended. Let's see more in detail the cycle with the main modules used and subroutines in a one phase example. After the initialization of all calculation and geometry parameters, the Lagrangian phase starts. The subroutines used in this phase are located in the module Lagrangian phase. All the information needed for the solving of the momentum equations are transferred from material points to nodes. And then the momentum equations are solved to get nodal velocities. In the convective phase, located in the model dynamic convective phase, material point velocity is updated from nodal accelerations. Using the shape functions and particle strain is updated using the B matrix, which is located in a completely different subroutine. After that, incremental stresses are computed with a constitutive model and position and housekeeping information is updated on the material points. 
Finally, uh, the mesh is reset. In the modules corresponding to the writing of the results, which have a module for each type, the output is written for open it with the post process available options that are part of or git and or for being used in next time steps. To assess the computational performance of the code, more than 20 cases have been profiled, including short benchmarks, more complex tutorial manual simple cases, and finally, some cases with high complexity and computational time. For the last ones, the writing of the results is the most expensive task. But where does the code spend most of the time without taking into account the writing of the results? Here we can see a significant result extracted from the profiling of 10 different odometer cases with the five main expensive functions. The first most expensive subroutine is the search of the new element where a material point is located after the material point updates its position. With these results and having checked that the determination of local coordinates from global ones is the most expensive function after writing the results in more complex cases, it is decided to improve the computational performance of this process. The recursive subroutine, which Alex has already talked about, is located inside the material point method convective phase module, and it is able to find the new material point element no matter how many elements has crossed in a time step. First of all, a material point moves. It checks if the material point is in the same element as in the previous time step. If the material point is not inside, as in this case, it checks between which size it is located and finds the side crossed by the material point, here highlighted in yellow. After that, it checks if the material point is in the adjacent element to the cross site. This procedure continues until the material point is inside the considered element. The procedure is based on many geometrical operations that seems to need a lot of computational effort. That's why, to reduce the subroutine computational time, a new algorithm is proposed and included in the new release. This would be useful for structured and structured meshes. It is based on an exhaustive search. It directly checks if the material point is in the adjacent elements to the one where it was in the previous time step. If a material point moves more than one level of elements outside the initial one, the algorithm is not capable of finding the new element. And to avoid that, if necessary, the old subroutine will be called. If we profile five different cases using the previous version of the code and the new release version, 2024, we can clearly see a remarkable improvement on the subroutine performance that produces a global improvement between the two and 5% of the computational time. Having said that, in cases where material points are expected to move more than one element per time step, the performance of the new subroutine is similar to the previous one or marginally worse. Later on today, we will find a perfect example where this happens and has been used as a benchmark for checking the good functioning of this subroutine. As we have seen in Alex's presentation, another process to optimize a little bit more the search algorithm is being prepared for structured meshes. So we expect more advances in new releases. Apart from this searching algorithm improvement, in the near future, it is expected to allow the writing of results every user-defined number of load steps independently of the user uh, time step. This will improve the results writing task that, as we have commented, is the main computational time consumer in the code for complex examples. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> is there any question? No. OK. So in this case, I think we can um, close this session. We stop for a break and uh, we will be back at, uh, wait, uh, 14, uh, maybe 14, 15 is too early because we are a bit late. What do you think? Shall we start at uh, 2.30 or is, in the program, we have 2.15.
Yes, but we are a bit we late. Can start on a time. Later. A bit later. So we start at um, two in forty-five minutes from now. Good. I will stop recording. All right, yeah, I think Abdel, Abdel can go ahead and share a screen and get started. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Okay, hello everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, just gonna get a laser pointer. Okay, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Abdel, Abdel Rahman as Saidi. Uh, and today I'll be talking to you about recent advance, advances in IZG metric MPM. My PhD advisor is Dr. Albayero Colum, and my mentor at Los Alamos National Lab is um, Chris Long. The first thing that I want to start with is the motivation for this work. And the motivation really started by um, trying to address cell crossing error in MPM. And this error is well known. It's caused by the discontinuities in the shape function derivatives, and they are known to cause the stresses to deteriorate um, as they move from one element to another. There are potential remedies that have been proposed in the literature, um, such as the mixed integration scheme, where um, there is both the material points and the Gaussian points. Um, however, it's known to kind of average state parameters and, and might cause um, erasing of that history of the points. So it has not been um, popular in that sense with constitutive modeling. Another um, family of, um, of techniques are um, the modification of the derivative of the shape functions, such as the DDMP approach or the GIMP or the CPDI approach. For example, here with the DDMP, you see the solid line here uh, where you use this as a shape function um, derivative. However, with GIMP, you use this kind of slanted line uh, where you have slightly uh, overlapping elements here at these uh, edges. And the final approach is to actually go higher order. And going higher order means that you can use either um, Lagrange polynomials or any other family of uh, methods. However, uh, for today, I'm going to use um, non-uniform rational B-splines and the reason is that we're looking for shape functions that are continuous across the entirety of the domain. So in this case, I'm just giving an example here where we have this line or this curve, uh, and we have these control points, which are technically your, your nodes, and they control the shape of your curve. Um, and using the, the, the information of this um, line, using the, the, the the information that comes from your AutoCAD drawing, you can generate these B splines and find their derivatives. So in that sense, you have both B splines and the derivatives to conduct your analysis for this particular geometry. And the idea, as I mentioned, is to use NURBS functions from your CAD drawing um, for analysis. So technically we don't go through that mesh generation. So to kind of just walk you through how this approach interconnects with the shape function generation, imagine you have the surface. Um, the surface here is discretized into six elements. Um, here, this element is highlighted in orange, and you have a scaffolding on top of it called the control point net. And this acts as your, um, your node uh, grid that you solve your uh, equations on. You have the parameter space, and that's where your shape functions exist, they go from zero to one. So if you're in 2D, they are um, R squared. If you're 3D, they are R cubed. And you can perform the tensor product of these functions to find um, a surface that is the shape function for a particular point on this net. As you can see, it goes to one. However, using a Jacobian, we can extend it to the physical domain. The parent space goes from negative one to one and it's used for all integration in this analysis. So we still make use of Gaussian integration throughout this uh, procedure. So all of these spaces are interconnected with Jacobian. However, the integration is um, still in this element here. This approach is uh, mainly using the cox de Boer equation. So it's, a piece, so, it's, so it's a recursive equation starting from piecewise constant with p is equal to zero. And then we go higher order depending on how much 
a high, how high you want to go in terms of p, you use your p minus one, uh, and your xi here is a function of your um, point location in the parameter domain. Okay, so you you always need to go you need to use your p minus one to get your p. So in this sense, giving you an example where you have this dot vector that comes from your AutoCAD geometry or your preprocessor. First, you start from a piecewise constant. You generate this in your particular domain locations, and then you go to linear. And then, you, for example, in this case, let's look at this case. You use this and this uh, shape functions to generate this particular hat function in the linear, um, p is equal to 1. And then if you want to go p is equal to 2, then you use this and this. So it's a recursive equation that depends on the previous orders. As I mentioned, we can easily go to 2D by doing the tensor product. And here I'm showing uh, this control net for this kind of funky geometry, if you like. Uh, and if we try and look at the shape functions for this particular node, I'm, I'm plotting it here, where it's interpolatory at this point, meaning that it's one here, and it kind of decreases everywhere else. However, if you look at this particular node uh, or this particular control point, then it's kind of smoother uh, and it kind of, um, because, because there's overlap between the elements, so you see that it's kind of less than one here at the center. Okay. The first example that I kind of want to go through is very simple. I just have a column where I'm fixing the base, uh, applying gravity on this column, and I'm looking at the stresses. I'm using a viscoelastic consistent model, um, where with larger deformations, you see more and more of that nonlinearity. I'm plotting the analytical solutions for 1g, so meaning 1 times the gravitational acceleration, and then I'm increasing it to 12.5g 12, 12 um, for a different number of material points uh, here, as you can see in this graph. Elevation on the y-axis and stress on the x-axis. And we see here that as you, as you start increasing the number of material points, even for a very coarse mesh of four elements, you see that you start getting closer and closer convergence to that analytical solution. Same thing goes for the 12.5g. And if we increase the number of elements, we kind of get faster convergence uh, in this sense, um, and we get um, kind of almost dead on results when it comes to looking at the analytical solution. So to quantify that further, uh, going into more numerically quantifying the root mean square errors, first looking at the secondary variable stress, which is the, the variable of interest in this particular presentation. Um, so root mean square error on the y-axis, and number of elements on the x-axis, and here for the primary variable displacement, uh, root mean square error versus number of elements. And I'm looking at different number of material points for um, a particular uh, discretization of four elements. And we see here that as you increase the number of material points, you start getting um, kind of, you start reducing this error quite significantly. And as you increase that um, the number of elements, you see a convergence that is between linear and quadratic. However, this convergence rate depends on how many material points you have in your cell and depends on how many integration, how much in integration error you carry as you perform your numerical integration on the material points. And we usually see different convergence rates with stresses and spacements in GIMP and CPDI techniques. However, in this case, we kind of see very similar convergence rates, which is somewhere between linear and quadratic, uh, depending on the number of the material points. Kind of looking at this uh, different um, edge, if you like, so if you, we have the same root mean square error, but we have a number of material points. We see that the number of material points really matters when it comes to uh, this estimation of the mean square error. And we see that as we increase the number of material points, we see kind of a convergence rate almost at a quadratic rate for both of the uh, unknowns. So I would argue it's very important to also have parameter analysis on the material points, just as much as you would on the um, number of elements. This approach well integrates with the material with the Anwar 3D framework. So in this case, I'm showing you a two-phase um, coupled 1D uh, analysis. So the, the implementation is fully 3D. So in this case, uh, I'm showing you the Terazaghi consolidation problem, elevation on the y-axis, and a normalized pore water pressure on the x-axis um, for different discretization. So in this case, in this graph, it's all five elements. And as I increase the number of material points, I see that I kind of converge to a particular um, solution that is somewhat, um, you know, 
it resembles the analytical solution, but it's different from the analytical solution a little bit, with the analytical solution being here, the solid black line. As I increase the number of elements, I see that I start getting closer and closer to that uh, analytical solution. Um, noting that I'm not using any damping in these simulations, uh, no damping whatsoever in this case, uh, and applying traction at the top of the column to generate these forward pressures. So moving on, in the same manner as I showed the, the one-phase gravity column solution, uh, I'm showing it here for the pulmonary pressure root mean square error. And interestingly, if you have a coarse mesh, you see this reduction in the in the root mean square error over the pulmonary pressure in a way um, that, as, as you'd expect, you start getting these um, reduction in, in the root mean square error for, for, for this particular five element uh, mesh. Uh, even with the increase in number of tier points, you don't see as much change in the trend. However, we see that as you change the number of elements, for, for example, you look at the 20 elements and two material points, you see that you kind of plateau until you start reducing further with time. Um, with, the, with the finer meshes, we see that it starts to slightly increase until it decreases again in a very periodic manner as the material points cross uh, from one cell to another, and they are in non-optimal positions within the element. So this kind of tells you that um, if you refine the mesh, you really need to increase the number of material points to get that same convergence as you would in a coarse mesh. And it's not always the fine mesh that would give you the least errors. So we have to be very mindful of that, particularly with time as the material points move within the mesh. Um, in the same manner, we look at the pore to pressure root mean square error versus the number of elements. And as I mentioned, although we, we it's likely to get that reduction in the root mean square error, however, if you reach a state where you have non-optimal um, integration within the element, you might have a slight increase in this particular case, uh, as we see particularly for larger times when you have large deformations. However, I'll tell you that the root mean square is still within the range of 10 to negative three. So it just really depends on um, the integration that you have in the element. And this also um, was done for uh, the two phase plus suction formulation in the Earth 3D um, in the same manner, looking for um, elevation on the Y axis and normalized suction on the X axis for both um, the coarse discretization and the fine discretization. Um, as you can see, you know you can uh, get uh, very good analytical solutions with no damping uh, if you have um, if you use kind of this this framework. Um, in the same manner, we see this reduction in the root mean square error of the suction with coarse meshes. With finer meshes, we see this slight increase until it, it decreases again in a periodic fashion. So it's very important to kind of um, understand how these integration errors manifest on your uh, particular uh, solution. Moving on to a fully 3D example. So I'm using, I'm showing here a very thin, so this, this framework also addresses complex geometries. So looking here at this very thin cylinder with very um, kind of low aspect ratio, um, thickness of about one centimeter and a height of five meters. I apply the traction here um, in the inner area where I internalize kind of, the, I have internal pressure pushing the cylinder in a way. Um, so it's kind of like a pressurized vessel um, and um, it kind of deforms to, to show you this deformation. And we can compare this to the analytical solution that comes from um, Kirchhoff shells, placement on the y-axis, length on the x-axis. Uh, we see that we, as we have uh, initial match is pretty, Good. However, as we have larger deformations, it's really hard to obtain these kind of um, characteristics of the shell theory. However, we were pleased that we were able to get that um, kind of average displacement solution, even though it's hard to get these um, kind of kinks in our um, solution versus, versus length, particularly because the, the normal of the traction is in the direction of the initial normal and then that's not updated with time. Moving on, uh, we can also do a multi-patch analysis. So we have kind of four patches stitched together, applying gravity and we're kind of compressing this cylindrical um, solid. Uh, and we see we're trying to generate um, 
stresses up to 6G, a very, very um, kind of quick five seconds dynamic um, simulation. Um, and with that, um, I just would like to summarize that I've shown you how IGNPM can be used to improve large deformations. So we, however, we have to be mindful of um, the, the stressed errors that we're trying to obtain with our results. Uh, and uh, we can see that we can obtain accurate answers for complex geometries, uh, and it integrates well within your um, kind of uh, CAD framework without the need for generating uh, a mesh, okay? Uh, I just have those here, just to kind of remind you how smooth the, these shape functions are. And with that, I'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Abdel. This will pause just for a minute to see if any questions come in. I don't see any in the chat. Well, I have a question, Abdel. Uh, <clears throat> sure. So if um, you say the future work will focus on more complex constitutive equations, what do mm -hmm. you envision will be like a challenge? Is there like a issue regarding uh, history dependent materials or whether you think it's uh, gonna be needed to make it work with, with that? Um, I think challenges in terms of application of boundary conditions that do not conform with the uh, mesh can be slightly challenging uh, initially. So I, I've had, um, in, in the problem where I showed the 3D shell kind of problem, it was kind of difficult for me to apply this um, boundary condition if I didn't have the mesh starting from here. So because I had the mesh kind of starting right at the interface where I'm applying pressure internally, then it worked fine. However, if I have the mesh kind of extending all the way, kind of mesh meshing or the control net kind of meshing all the way um, across the entirety of this quarter of a circle, if you like, in, 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 a, in a 2D manner, then it will be difficult to apply the boundary conditions because they are only weakly enforced, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, the boundary conditions are only weakly enforced um, you'd have to be clever with how you discretize your control net if you're trying to get strongly enforced boundary conditions. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, sorry, not, not directly related to consistent modeling, but just in terms of like geometry. Thanks, Abdel. I don't see any more questions, so I think we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, thank you. All right, next up, we've got Harsha Varden Kurugodu, and I apologize for any mispronunciation there, but please go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, great. So, yeah, let's share my screen. Well, are you able to see my presentation? Yes, we are. That's great. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and I think I actually wasn't able to hear you what you spell, but I hope you did spell it, right? Well, fine. Uh, so uh, my presentation here is going to be on numerical investigation of bio-inspired flow mechanism using the material point method. So I am a PhD student from uh, IIT Delhi. Uh, the others are the supervisors. Oh, uh, uh, just hold on.
Okay. So, yeah, I quickly start the motivation of my studies. Uh, basically, we know the uh, piezocone penetration test is a very popular in-situ testing method. Basically, to characterize the subsurface soil profiles and also determine the critical properties. Uh, in CP2 test, usually a cone is pushed uh, into the soil to measure the uh, uh, soil response in, in the form of cone tip resistance, uh, soil friction, or uh, a sleeve friction, or the pore pressure. Based on this data, we basically interpret the soil properties. However, uh, for uh, cone penetration, it is basically ac accomplished using a hydrostatic pushing vehicle, as shown here, uh, anchored to the soil. Although CBT offers many benefits, it also have limitations, such as anchoring and moving this uh, pushing vehicle. And this can be challenging for soils under existing foundations, also the difficult terrain, such as slopes and forest lands. Uh, so to solve that problem, so we can uh, we can approach the bio-inspired geotechniques, which is an emerging field in which inspiration is taken from the natural biological process to potentially address these challenges. For example, for the soil penetration problem, inspiration can be taken uh, from many burrowing uh, species in nature that can move through deep soils using energy efficient self-penetration techniques, such as a uh, razor clam or earthworm. Here we can see the earthworm moving uh, uh, by anchoring itself and uh, moving forward. So this is basically the idealized version of it, which can be uh, used uh, uh, to solve the uh, anchoring problem where uh, the pushing vehicle cannot be taken uh, uh, or anchored. Fine. So uh, the objective of the study is basically to uh, understand uh, and develop a numerical model uh, 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 using material point method to simulate this multi-staged self-penetration process. In this multi-stage self-penetration process, basically there are three stages where initially the cone is penetrated inside and the anchor is expanded as shown here. And uh, the tip, it, uh, uh, tip is advanced with the help of this anchor. Uh, simulating a multi-stage self-penetration process poses a quite, challenge, quite a challenge in Android 3D due to its lack of sta stage construction support in the present version available to the users in public domain. This limitation has been overcome in the study and the source folds have been modified to simulate the physical process involved. This figure shows uh, uh, a flow chart for workaround implementation of multi-stage self-penetration. Uh, initially, GOM and CPS uh, files uh, for the cone penetration uh, were created using the GID preprocessing tool. After that, uh, a computation stage is performed. Later, these uh, uh, output files is copied to the new folder where uh, a new GOM file and uh, up with the updated nodal positions is uh, 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 developed. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so uh, created. Then the uh, MPM computations are performed, and we get the output files and uh, follow it through to the next stage. Fine. So uh, after implementation of this, uh, a parametric uh, 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 we perform a parametric study to investigate the effects of the probe geometry, soil state, and layered stratification on the behavior of the bio-inspired probes with the help of the MPM framework, which is established. And this is the bio-inspired self-penetrating cone pressure meter, which is adopted for this study. Uh, uh, this is the geometry of it. And these are the three different geometries which are adopted to study the probe uh, geometry effects and uh, two different soil states were studied and also the layering are also studied. Uh, before starting this, uh, the cone pressure meter probe, which is shown in, the, in this figure, uh, basically uh, is a combination of the cone penetrometer, uh, cone penetrometer and also the pressure meter. So before advancing with the modeling of the multi-stage process, which is very complex, an initial stage of benchmarking was carried out separately for the cone penetration and the pressure meter test problem. So here, we see uh, this is the global responses of the cone penetration stage, uh, so uh, the, which aligns closely with the uh, existing uh, uh, studies. And uh, pressure meter can be uh, divided into two types. Like one, uh, people usually do the cylindrical cavity expansion, which is the idealized version of the pressure meter. So uh, initial uh, study, uh, we have also uh, uh, compared uh, the uh, MPM results with the closed form solutions, which shows a, a very good uh, match. And next, uh, the actual rate dependent test of the pressure meter. Here we can see uh, 
that it is also closely matching uh, with the uh, uh, existing uh, experimental studies. So with this, uh, we can say that the MPM results is uh, working well with both the cone penetration test and also pressure meter test. Moving forward, so this is the geometry which was adopted for the, uh, uh, how should I say, the bio-inspired probe, actual multi-stage problem. So this is the geometry. Uh, we perform everything in the 2D axisymmetric uh, thing. Uh, and uh, triangular element is uh, uh, adopted here. And the mesh size and the mesh, uh, mass scaling factor was uh, decided after conducting the sensitivity analysis. This is the boundary condition. Material properties uh, of relatively medium dense or loose soil and the dense soil uh, were list are listed here. Uh, for simplicity of the problem, more Coulomb elastic, perfectly plastic was uh, adopted for this study. Strength parameters were uh, assumed to be replicated, uh, uh, assumed to replicate relatively medium dense and the loose uh, states of the soils. Uh, adopting a similar approach as uh, Galavi in uh, 2018 uh, in the axisymmetric paper, as more Coulomb material model does not actually capture the state dependency. Coming to this, uh, comparative and initially comparative analysis of the bio-inspired probe response in context of MPM with the DEM framework was conducted to evaluate the robustness of the established multi-staged model. Stage one involved the cone penetration at constant rate of 0.02 uh, meter per second, while measuring the cone tip resistance following the standard piezo cone penetration testing protocol. Global response show a close alignment with the DEM studies. Coming to the local responses, uh, stresses were uh, predominantly concentrated within uh, two to four times of the uh, diameter of the probe, which were found in line with those reported in the DEM studies by the Chen et al. 2022. Coming to the next stage, similarly for the next stage, pressure meter module expansion stage, which involved halting the cone penetration at a particular depth as shown here, uh, and allowing the radial expansion of the pressure meter module at a defined 0.2% uh, per second of initial probe diameter till the target value of 1.5 times of the probe was achieved. The MPM results align, uh, again, well with the DEM studies as, shown, as seen here, Furthermore, parametric study of the probe configuration identifies the relation between the pressure meter module length uh, and the module pressure. Uh, here, 8 dc means uh, the uh, 4 dc, 8 dc, and 2 dc basically means the length of the uh, uh, anchor. Like this is the four times of the dc. 8 dc will be double of it, which is shown in the previous slides. Fine. Uh, the close alignment between the uh, this, this, this shows the local responses of uh, the same stage. The close alignment between the DEM and MPM results obtained is a testament to this established framework's high repeatability and accurate prediction of multi-stage bio-inspired probe mechanism. Further parametric study on the influence of soil states indicate a clear correlation uh, between, the in, uh, uh, between an increase in the soil density with the increase in the cone tip resistance as shown in, the, in this figure for the cone penetration stage. However, a significant difference in the evolution of the cone tip resistance with the depth was observed with the layer strata highlighting the influence of the multiple soil layers. In the local responses, uh, as shown here, distribution uh, of uh, stresses in a layered soil was similar around the cone as a uh, medium dense, whereas stress accumulation was observed at the layer transitions. Uh, these responses could be reasoned by the interlayer movement of soil at the layer transitions. Similar to the cone penetration stage, influence of the soil state clearly indicates the correlation uh, between an increase in soil density with the increase in the module pressure. However, pressure meter module expansion uh, is maximum, uh, 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 sorry, pressure meter module ma expansion in the layered soil, the maximum uh, P, the, the maximum P, that's the module pressure, is below the average of uh, both the dense and the loose soils. Global responses align with the local responses demonstrated by changes in the stress state uh, uh, between uh, the pressure meter model expansion and the cone penetration phases. In the next uh, stage, uh, that is the tip advancement stage. The cone tip was advanced to a, a depth of uh, one times the diameter of the probe by elongating the connector at a standard rate of 0.02 millimeter per, se uh, meter per second. While keeping the posterior part of the probe, at rest. 
during the step advancement stage soil layering and the soil state had almost equivalent reductions uh, showing not much difference actually and these are the local responses of that particular stage uh, coming to the end of the conclusions a novel implementation strategy was developed for the state was studying the multi-staged bio-inspired probe uh, response, which involves sequential stages, including penetration, pressure meter model expansion, and the tip advancement. The MPM framework is systematically examined by studying the influence of probe geometry, soil state, and also the layered strata on the bio-inspired uh, uh, probe response. The findings reveal that the probes with the longer modules are more efficient than their shorter or double module counterparts. Uh, meanwhile, the BI, uh, BIAC is basically bio-inspired probe response during all stages in different soil states corroborates its sensitivity to the soil's mechanical properties. Although layered status significantly influenced the bio-inspired probe response during the penetration and expansion stage, it had minimal impact during the tip advancement stage. Uh, so thank you. So if there are questions, I can take. Thank you, Harsha. Nice presentation. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I've got a question for you. So the, the results you yeah. presented were, were really nice. I'm curious if you have, um, I don't think you presented any in, in this presentation, but have you started looking at, at kind of validating this with lab data or field data? I'd be curious to know how they compare. Right, uh, actually I'm also working on sidelines uh, to actually develop an experimental setup for this because there was no experimental studies on the bio-inspired probes because it's difficult to basically do the test. However, uh, uh, I currently have validated this work with the DM studies, which is basically physics-based uh, numerical uh, approach. So currently I do have this. Awesome. Well, looking forward to seeing the, the lab results as well. That should be an interesting study. I have a, another question. Is, uh, so from what I understood, you just use CPS and gun file modifications to simulate this, right? Is that correct? Right, right. Yeah, that's it's, it. Was curious. It's very clever. I think what you have done. Thank you. Uh, I want to add an addition. Basically, for the GOM file, we also had to update the nodal positions because uh, the first stage was a cone penetration, and it is associated. I mean, I am actually using the moving mesh, so the nodal position changes. So I had to update it. Uh, but basically, you didn't have to code with anything, or did you, in say Nanora 3D? Did you have to, 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 to you know, create new code for this, or was just uh, no, CPS no, and no, go? No. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's smart. <laughs> All right, I don't see any other questions. So thank you so much, Harsha. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Looks like. Next up will be Louise Angel. Yes. Yeah. All right, Sorry. we can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. One second. Yeah. By now, can you hear my screen? Yep, looks good. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Angel Aviles. I am part of the Andrea developer team. And today I will to talk about an uh, insight on the drawing boundary condition on saturated, uh, on saturated soils. The presentation covered uh, the drawing boundary conditions in NPM and the validation with some benchmark and experimental tests. The validation example used uh, in this presentation used one point to phase with such formulation and the early boundary condition presented here are uh, additional to the already existing boundary condition in Anura by Shekato and Martinelli. Here we discuss two hydraulic boundary conditions. The first one is the infiltration rate boundary condition which is used to impose a rainfall condition on surface. And when we do that, okay, sorry, just to point out here. After we post the infiltration rate boundary condition, 
we uh, compute an infiltration soil capacity uh, using this formula under the assumption of zero pore pressure at the boundary. If the infiltration soil capacity is less than the imposed rainfall, the remaining flow will either accumulate or be lost to the surface runoff. Water accumulation is not permitted, so the computer values and the liquid of the liquid and, and solid velocity are considered accurate, these values. Otherwise, if we need, if we need to apply a correction of the liquid and solid, so we need to do, use some approaches that I will show you next. Uh, such that the net infiltration becomes zero at the boundary conditions. To do this correction, we can use two approaches. The first one is done in terms of the solid and liquid by imposing the floods and maintaining the momentum balance equation of the mixture, where we need to estimate a, a correct velocity increment for the liquid and for the soil. And the in order to match the imposed uh, uh, floods on the surface. The second approach is, is by imposing the floods under the assumption of zero relative acceleration of the liquid with respect to the solid. In this approach, both as the acceleration solid and liquid are the same, so we compute an only acceleration field. With this acceleration, we compute next the new velocity fields of the solids, and then we compute the velocity field of the liquid. Uh, okay. Yes. This, was, this second option is restricted to problems with negligible relative acceleration between solids and liquid. Uh, also, this approach is less general, and when it, in, this approach is used when with large model, the computational loss is cheaper. So with this approach, we use uh, some validation sample using a rigid column. The first is a rigid column from one meter high, selected to an infiltration on the free surface here, and with a linear distribution of the initial solution um, with uh, this uh, restriction in the mechanical uh, hydraulic part, so just on the boundaries. Here we show the result for four different rainfall intensities. The results are extracted from a node located on the, on the free surface. And look at the blue curve, when the rainfall intensity in the beginning, the rainfall intensity is lower than soil infiltration capacity and all the floods uh, become in infiltration floods. So there is no runoff generated. During this time, uh, the infiltration, the, the infiltration floods increase the volume of the water in the partial saturated pores until that point, one point, sorry, where the infiltration rate begins to decrease uh, because the capacity of the soil is lower than the rainfall intensity. And then in, during this uh, stage, the runoff is generated. Once the column becomes saturated, we reach an steady state with constant floods that is equal to the saturated hydraulic conductivity. All the infiltration, rainfall infiltration uh, examples are was, were uh, done with the same saturated permeability. And when the infiltration rate for intensity is lower than saturated permeability, we can see that the water flows freely through the soil columns. We model the same column using Codebry, a finite element method, and results are the same. In both cases, maximum infiltration is governed by the soil capacity. 
However, the approach to the rainfall intensity on the surface occurs in a different way due to the implementation of the method in the right for this type of condition. These figures show the evolution in time of the pressure for two rainfall intensities, 2.5 and 0.75. Boris uh, using NPN and NPN. Um, both results and both distribution are very similar for the different times. But notice that uh, in this simulation, uh, we limit the core in the surface equal to zero uh, because it's an initial condition that we can uh, prescribe uh, at the beginning. Previous results of the infiltration through the column are not general, as they depend on the material with lower saturated permeability. Here we show uh, a variation of the model. Uh, in a case with a less permeable layer in the middle of the soil column, this layer has a permeability two orders of magnitude lower than the upper and lower material, and we suggest uh, the soil column to a rainfall intensity. Uh, initially, the infiltration flow is lower than soil capacity so, um, as the water flow has not reached the impervious layer. So there is no effect of any lower boundary condition. Such profiles are similar to the previous one or infiltration profile are similar to the previous one without in any impermeable layer. Later, once the water flows and uh, reach the impervious layer here, the stationary state is controlled by the saturated permeability of the impervious layer. Um, the upper part of the column becomes um, of the distribution will correspond to a saturated hydrostatic profile here in this part. Okay, okay. the second uh, type of hydraulic boundary condition is the surface condition where only outflow is permitted this condition is typically applied along the downstream side of a river embankment, subject to an imposed water level upstream and downstream. In this condition, outflow is allowed when liquid pressure exceeds a predefined value of the liquid pressure. Correction need to be made if the inflow occurs when this condition is not fulfilled. So we need to correct by imposing the zero floods on the surface in this kind of boundary conditions. To validate this, we use the same column <clears throat> with the one meter high. And the column has a high constant solution and we impose a pore pressure at the bottom, a pore pressure a little high. Then the suction profile change because seepage allows flow to exit but not to enter. Not, notice that the imposed value, which in this case is zero on the surface, is reached uh, at the end of the simulation here. But this value can be different from zero if we impose at the beginning. And we, we impose it in, at the beginning. Uh, finally, we simulate an experimental flow test where a slope is subject to a rainfall. We present the flow geometry that we consider for the model uh, and some instrumentation. Here we see some kind of piezometer for water pressure gauge and surface displacement meter. Here, uh, which uh, we show the mesh with element size of 0 0.05 meter and three point material point per element. The artificial rainfall was applied to trigger instability, and the dynamic explicit formulation of ANURA requires high computational cost for simulating filtration. 
So the time step size is increased using mass scaling and assuming that the initial effects are negligible in this first stage of the saturation of the infiltration part. This tool is deactivated once the failure starts, which is a faster dynamic process. We use the more prolonged consecutive model, but without considering, considering such an effect. And three stages are modeled. One is the initialization stage. Second one is the rainfall of saturation process. And the third one is the failure process. The results indicate that failure start around 9,000 seconds and marked by significant strain and deformation in the material or perception of the plummet, of the plummet test. And at this time, the saturation line is similar to the observed in the experimental one. Here we compare the result in time of select nodes uh, from piezometer located at the bottom of the experimental, experimental test. And the failure, the dot value correspond to the experimental data, while the continuous value correspond to the medical. The failure in the simulation, as you can see, occurred in a similar range, interval of time, sorry, than the experimental. So in terms of failure onset, there is a match between model and experiment using this is already under condition. The failure is similar in the upper part of the model. And after the failure, the, the position of the material occurs in the central section in the numerical model. This value is higher than the value of displacement here was 5.8 meter. And this value is higher than the accumulative surface displacement register of 3.9 meters. This difference can be associated with the initial state of the material, maybe with the initial assumption of the suction, or uh, probably because the effect of the suction uh, on the strength is not included in the constructive model molecular user for this simulation. So as a conclusion, we have the annular 3D can deal with the technical engineering problem that we take require the definition of hydraulic compared condition for saturated and unsaturated soils. Uh, the implementation of the hydraulic boundary condition has been validated with two benchmarks, whether, whether composed of a single material or with material with different permeabilities. Uh, an instrumented real scale experiment from a test or a rainfall induced uh, was simulated and showing the capacity, the capability, sorry, of Havanua 3D to deal with this kind of boundary condition and saturated on uh, and unsaturated soils. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. There is a so question. Think... Yeah, so this, the question is, can you quantify the difference in computational time between MPN and FEM for both cases you have shown? Uh, yes, well, and we have uh, a model where the, well, it's not a so large model, but in percentage, the reduction in time was about five to 10%. Uh, because we say some loops during the, during the computation. So basically because we say, or we discard some loops during the calculations, but five to 10%. That's another question. Do you mind to explain how did you define mass scaling factor? Okay, mass scaling factor is um, a feature that already exists in, in Angola 3D. Basically, uh, this scale the mass and the, the 
yes, the, the mass of the, of the model and decrease the, the gravity in order to match the same proportion of the, uh, of the delta time because we know that the delta time depends on the density. So we scale the density and we reduce the, the gravity. So in this case, in ANURA 3D, we also scale, we only scale the density of, of the materials. And with that, the delta increment is larger. So we use that to solve the momentum equation. Uh, um, it's very it's simple and it's already included in ANURA 3D. Here, I use uh, mass scaling of 1,000 times. It means that if I uh, density of 1.8 ton, uh, tons by kilometer, uh, this scale 1,000 times the density. Yes. And with that value, we go to the momentum equation, and we continue, we bond, we compute the increment of time according with this new density of the material. All right. Thank you, Luis Angel. I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next presentation. So the last one in this group will be Xingyi Sun. OK, I will share my slide. Can you hear me and yep, we can see hear you. my slide? Yep. Does that work? Yep, it's not in presentation mode yet, but we can see it. OK, OK, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Xingye Sun, and I'm from the College of Civil Engineering and Architecture at Zhejiang University. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to the NORA 3D community for inviting me to take an oral presentation in the online workshop. Uh, today, uh, I will be sharing with, uh, with you the evaluation of the soil dynamic response during the vibratory pair driving based on the uh, NPM FBM method. Mm, so let's get started. Uh, my presentation can be divided into the four parts. The first is the research background. Uh, the vibratory repair driving method is widely used in the uh, onshore and offshore repair installation projects because of the advantage of the high uh, durability, uh, low noise, and little damage to the power foundation. Mm. The driving force is offered by the eccentric rotors rotation. Uh, in this way, uh, in this way, we can guide the acceleration and the velocity and the, the displacement through the integration. Uh, however, the P waves, ice waves, and surface waves are generated with the power penetration during the power driving. Uh, the, the propagation of these waves in the soil may damage the nearby buildings and interfere with people's normal life. Mm, in order to analyze this problem, scholars mainly use the numerical simulations method. Uh, the common numerical method can be classified into the two categories, such as the discontinuous medium mechanics and the continuous medium mechanics. Mm, the DM, uh, this great element method, is a typical method for the DMM. Mm, it involves the uh, particle and particles and contacts to uh, simulate a large deformation and the soil structure interaction. Uh, however, uh, the drawback of the DM is uh, is low uh, computational efficiency and hard to determine the parameters. Mm. For the CMM, it can be categorized as the uh, uh, mesh methods and the methodless methods and hybrid methods. Mm. 
uh, for the match methods, uh, CEL and PFEM and ALE is the technical uh, methods for the match methods. Mm. Uh, CL methods introduced uh, uh, Elorin uh, description to simulate a large dis uh, deformation behavior, and uh, LLE used the adaptive remesh technology, and it can't uh, totally overcome the problem of the mesh dis distortion. Mm. And it's difficult to introduce the complex constitutive model for the ball method. Uh, For the massless methods, um, SPH is a massless uh, Lagrangian method based on the continual assumption. Uh, the drawback of the SPH is uh, is computational precise is conditionally stable. Um, for the hybrid methods, uh, MPM is able to adopt the history dependent constitutive mo model to describe the soil behavior. Uh, there are the two K, the two cases about the MPM in geotechnical uh, application. Uh, they are downloaded uh, by the Honora YouTube website. Um, based on the mass and momentum uh, conversation equations and update, uh, update the information on the protocol. It's easy to introduce the complex uh, constitutive models to consider the different conditions. So we back to uh, the initial problem. The vibration assessments induced by the pair driving is a multi-scale deformation uh, with both uh, the large deformation regions near the pile and small deformation away from the pile. Mm. Uh, so, uh, taking into account the pros and cons of the MPM and the FEM, uh, uh, it's necessary to conduct the research of the mixed method. In this way, we try to take advantage of the MPM and FEM to deal with the multi-scale deformation problem. Uh, so let's go to the next section. In this section, I will introduce the theory and verify the mixed method. The idea of the MPM FBM method is as follows. Uh, MPM is used for the modeling the large deformation areas and FBM is used in the rest areas. The solution precise includes the first is we create a whole mesh in the pre-processing software. And then we apply the MPM in the large deformation areas and the calculation. And third, we transfer the information of the common nodes to the FEM. And finally, we carry out the FEM calculation and proceed to the next time step. Uh, so the key point is how to uh, how to calculate the shared boundary between the two methods and how to transfer the information to the FEM. So for the first question, uh, we use the absorbing boundary elements and we apply the K0 states reactive force to simulate the real condition. Mm. The absorbing boundary elements contain the spring and the dash part. Uh, and here is the uh, precise to determine the value of the spring and the dash part. Dash part. And then we use the FEM theory to apply the uniformly uh, distributed load and the triangular load to the MPM model. Uh, in this way, we can um, simulate the K0 state. Mm. For the second question, we use the Python to precise the information about the shared boundary. Uh, as figure as uh, as this figure shown, uh, we convert the point data to the node uh, and apply it to the FEM in batch. And we apply the velocity calculated by the MPM uh, to the FEM model, and there are no back propagation precise. 
The process contained the five steps. The first is we divided the whole mesh into the two regions. And then we apply the MKM uh, and calculate. Uh, the third, we calculate the information of the nodes and apply them to the FBI model. And finally, we visualize the true method in a unified way. Mm. The time step is controlled by uh, by the following equations. It generally means the P waves cannot propagate across the elements within a single time step. Uh, for the FEM, uh, method we can use the implicit integration in this way. The time step can be larger than the MPM. Mm, and then we use the straight penetration to verify the proposed method. Mm, due to the uh, symmetry, half of the problem is modeled in the 2D uh, plane string condition. The model is four meters long and the dimension of the MPM region are both 2.4 meters. The penetration velocity is 0 0.05 meter per second. Mm, the right figure shows the vertical stress in the initial condition. And as the time progresses, the distribution of the uh, the vertoric string is similar to the Prentel's solution. And here is the normalized uh, reaction force. The value is near uh, is near to the two plus pi. And the second case is the two-dimensional wave propagation problem. The MPM uh, model is eight, uh, eight meters long and four meters high. And the center point of the surface, uh, uh, we we apply a Ricker wavelet form as the model's load, and the uh, the figure of the load is uh, is shown in in the red figure, and the uh, uh, materials of the MPM and FEM are the same. Uh, the time step of the MPM, oh, sorry, sorry. The time step of the MPM is uh, one millisecond and the uh, for the FEM, the time step is two millisecond and the total uh, computational time is the 0 0.5 second. Mm, then, uh, we established a model of the same size using the traditional MPM to compare our uh, results. Uh, the left side is the uh, traditional uh, MPM results and the right side uh, is the proposed, uh, is the result of the proposed method uh, with the different type. Uh, we show the the vertical velocity and uh, the vertical stress. And the uh, results show uh, they are consistent. Mm, the, the results, uh, the results, the, the result by the proposed method is, is consistent with the traditional method, traditional MPM method. Mm, besides, we extract the velocity a curve at the point A and the point B. And the results shows they are consistent with the results calculated by the traditional MPM method. Mm, during the uh, vapor, uh, during the uh, vibratory pair driving, the soil behavior is complex involving the Phenomena such as uh, cyclic shakedown and uh, degradation. Uh, in this way, we introduced the bonding surface model and design a uh, triaxial cyclic loading uh, drainage uh, model uh, model to test the constitutive model. Uh, 
And here is the surface function, the uh, hardening and the flow rule and the plastic uh, uh, modulus. And this constitutive model um, uh, is from this uh, uh, reference. Mm, the mechanical response under the uh, click, uh, click join loading conditions was simulated using the cubic unit, uh, cubic unit and uh, triangular load was cyclically loaded five times. And here is the soil parameters and uh, the, uh, the bottom is the uh, relevant parameters. Uh, the stress integration uh, algorithm was uh, the improved Euler integration uh, with the error control and this uh, constitutive model is capable of describing the response of the void and uh, stream with the cyclic loading. Uh, and we also compare the computation uh, efficiency of the proposed mo uh, method with the traditional uh, MPM. Uh, for the, the same model, uh, it's shown uh, an Im improvement of nearly 40%. Uh, we can see the last second columns and the cross. The cross represent the proposed model and the, the, the slash uh, represent the traditional MPM model. And uh, in this in this section, we will use the proposed method to access the uh, field of vibration. Uh, we take the ancient Mercury sea wall as an example. In order to reinforce the ancient sea wall, the paving construction is carried out in the front. So we we need to uh, we need to assess the vibration of the ancient sea wall during the paving process uh, and. Mm, because we use the uh, uh, Crawford Dam method, so the, uh, the 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 water is not considered in the calculation. Mm, we establish the model using the information on site and adopt the bonding surface constitu uh, constitutive model on the lot deformation region. Uh, and for the small deformation region, it used uh, 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 elastic constitutive model. Mm, and the uh, dimension of the MPM are both five meters. Uh, and based on the power parameters and the vibrator parameters, we apply a, a acceleration load to, to the power. Mm. And the time step, uh, the time step of the MPM is two, uh, is two hundred fifty microsecond, uh, microseconds, and uh, uh, for the FPM, the time step is one millisecond. Uh, and here is the initial condition of the, uh, and here is the uh, vertical stress of the initial condition, and we. Uh, uh, and the total uh, commutational, uh, uh, the total commutational uh, time is uh, uh, zero point five second, and we uh, extract the surface peak particle velocity such uh, uh, such as PPV in the MPM domain. Mm. Uh, we can uh, we can see the velocity decreases with the distance away from the pile, and we fit uh, uh, we fit the velocity using the uh, exper exponential function, and the fitting is uh, is good. And uh, combining the the velocity counter in the y direction at different time. Uh, it can be found that the uh, velocity uh, varies continuously at the shared boundary between the two 
uh, different mindset. Uh, and uh, calculation results of the vibration velocity at the sea wall, uh, at the toe of the sea wall, uh, is uh, is consistent with the uh, on-site monitoring results. And finally is the conclusions. Uh, uh, in this section, we we mainly uh, guide the three conclusions. The first is we propose the uh, MPM, MVM method. And the second is um, we found that uh, this, my, this method can significantly uh, improve the computational efficiency. And uh, third is uh, we take the uh, ancient mostly seawall as an example, and uh, the calculation results uh, were consistent with the on-site monitoring uh, results. And uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Xingyi. Nice presentation. Any questions? All right, I think maybe for the sake of time, we'll wrap up this this session. We're, we're a little over time here. So Francesca, do you still want to take our 15 minute break? Yes, we are a bit uh, late. Uh, um, what about uh, 10 minutes? Sounds good. So we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes, okay? Okay, thanks to all the presenters this session. See you back here soon. It's recording. No. You can go. Well, the chairs are, I think, Gaia and Kali here, right? Yes. Good. All right. I think you now can see my screen. So I'm going to start. And uh, the title of this presentation is Implementation of Bidirectional Thin Rigid Board Interactions in Android 3 d And this is a work that was conducted by one of my students, Anthony Flores, and I'm going to present uh, his work today uh, with all of you. Uh, this is the whole length of the presentation, but I'm going to start with uh, why we started doing this uh, process. And, and the reason is that we want to uh, be able of simulating uh, interactions between soil and structures in which some of their dimension is very, very small. And so to illustrate that example, here I have a, a picture of a suction caisson where as you can see, well, as you can, it's not pretty clear there, but the thickness of the wall, it's very, very small compared to the overall diameter of the suction casing, for example. And there are many cases like this in uh, soil structure interactions problems where basically one of the dimensions of the structures uh, vanishes and other examples are shown there as well. And one of the uh, additional motivations uh, to do this work is that uh, the current contact implementation in uh, Android 3D, which is part of Hagen's uh, contact algorithm, uh, relies on determination of the normals at the uh, at the nodes. And in Android 3D, we use conforming mesh uh, to represent the contact surface, which of course has uh, many advantages. Um, but one of the disadvantages that it has is that uh, the normals at the nodes can be uh, the definition of the normals can be ambiguous. And just to uh, uh, show that, uh, you can see that node over there. And according to how we loop through the faces, that normal can be either pointing downwards or pointing to the left. And so at the end of the day, what happens internally is that one of the normals have to be selected, which can lead to interpenetration problems in uh, uh, with this formulation. And so many iterations are typically needed to uh, uh, arrive to a model that uh, doesn't have this type of, of problem. The other issue that occurs with Barton Hagen's uh, simulations is that, is that uh, sometimes because of ill registration of points near the boundaries, 
and because rigid bodies typically have very large density compared to uh, the soil part, uh, well, this can lead to uh, velocities at the soil phase that are unrealistic, that looks like explosions typically when you see these effects. And so um, although we do have corrections for that, that's another things that from time to time happens as well using that algorithm. And the other thing that happens with or implementation of Pardenhagen is, is that when you have a body that moves, uh, we typically use the moving mesh again because we use a conforming mesh to simulate the contact, but that means that uh, we cannot simulate uh, fully rigid body motions, rotations, and things like that. And this is because, again, we have to move the mesh. Uh, this increases the likelihood of empty elements as well and in registration of the mass and stiffness nodes uh, when you use the moving mesh, which uh, can lead to other instabilities uh, due to ill registration of masses uh, in the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix as well. So with this implementation, we're looking to tackle all those uh, problems, but we also want to enable accurate modeling of rigid body mechanics, uh, support multi-body contact simulations. Uh, we also have uh, the capability of handling multiple materials in, in a single cell. And this is especially important when you, for example, are doing uh, penetration problems and uh, materials are gonna mix in some particular cells. And we also are looking up to uh, extend this uh, to accommodate structural deformations in the uh, structural elements. So as I said before, uh, the rigid bodies that we are interested in are, are bodies with, where one of the dimensions is very thin. Uh, so the other thing is most, you know, uh, we have to recall that structural stiffness of these rigid bodies is very, very high. So you also don't want to simulate that uh, because then you'll have a critical time set goes very low. Uh, and as again, so we want to collapse one of the dimensions in the thin rigid elements. So from now on, these are important things. Uh, notations are gonna use nodal quantities. Uh, so in the index J, material point quantity, index P, uh, rigid body quantity is gonna be uh, subscript R. Then when I, I use the hat, it's going to be a unit length, back, unit length vector. And for time step, I use uh, superscript K. OK, this is a definition of the rigid bodies that we are using. So first of all, we can use multiple uh, rigid bodies at a single simulation. And um, uh, one of the things that uh, you can see here is that our rigid bodies are actually a 1D bar meshes, basically. And they can take any form, but they are, they are 1D bar meshes. And so we have nodes and connectivities between them. And, and then the other thing that is important is that these rigid bodies or these meshes are not conforming with the original or the background mesh that we use to calculate accelerations. The other important change in this, uh, in this rigid body calculation is that the normals are defined, as you can see there, on the element level and not to the uh, normals. I'm sorry, not to the nodes but to the element level. And uh, finally, uh, yes, uh, as I was saying before, we want to uh, allow these elements to deform as a actual uh, structural elements in the future. Now, something that you have to see is that because these are thin elements, they have two sides, it's not closed boundaries. Uh, so the normals are gonna either point, say inside, or there's no inside actually, as I was mentioning before, but you can see they can point only in one direction, or they can be, for example, this direction here. But we do not define two sets of normal, just one uh, one set of normal. And just to put you in, put in context of uh, calculations procedures, the way in which uh, we adapted this, now we have two states, the state of the particles and the states of the rigid, the rigid bodies. And so uh, the row above in this figure shows the typical uh, calculations uh, cycle where you have you know, uh, transfer from from particle to node, and then the Lagrangian phase, and then the, the transfer from node to particles again. So we update the, uh, the material points positions. But now we also have a state of the rigid body. And so once uh, we are, say, at a time k for both materials or for both entities, where we uh, calculate the intersection between uh, particles and the rigid elements as uh, it is done in 
uh, the discrete element method. And then we calculate those input forces and then we pass those forces to the nodes using uh, shift functions. And then we kind of have the additional forces at the uh, mesh level that we use to update uh, position accounting for the, for the interactions between particles and rigid elements. And then we also, because we also have these forces on the rigid elements, we can also rotate, update the position of uh, these rigid entities here as well. Now, the way in which we detect uh, uh, contact is using a distance field. And so this distance field that we're uh, going to call uh, phi sub p, phi uh, subscript p, it's equal to the Eulerian distance between the particle and any of the bodies. And minus a radius of influence that we assign to the particle. And uh, so this, as you can tell here, this is a unique field, it doesn't, it's not multiple. Uh, so for example, if you have your, say you have two bodies and you have a material point, uh, what we do is calculate distances between all of them. We calculate minimum distances. And then uh, the minimum is the one that is uh, chosen for phi. So that's that's what I guess is gonna be the, the phi value. And then for the radius of influence, uh, we calculate that based on the mass of the particle and its density. And then we also assign this correction factor if you want, that's to control the size of that uh, uh, influence, radius of influence, as you can tell there. So that's uh, how we calculate this. So it's uh, evident here that contact occurs uh, even only if uh, the value of phi sub p is less than zero. Okay, so that's uh, what we use to, to detect contact. And so then the following process are going to be applied only if that's the case. Uh, and the other thing that we do is that when we detect this, uh, it's not particle, the particles, it's important here, I think there's a mistake here, the particles do not cross the boundaries, their radius of influence cross the boundaries. And then when, when, when that happens, we register that event into a affinity tensor that register what's the connection between the particle and the rigid body that will tell us uh, where to pass the forces and everything like that. So there's two op uh, cases possible uh, for the, the normal detection because that's something we have to do. And remember that reason is that we have just one set of normals. So for instance, one case uh, for the normal is based on the calculation of the sign of uh, this uh, dot product here where X is just the position the, a kind of a position with respect to one of the nodes of a rigid element. So this allows us to detect what side the point is and then we can flip. So this basically is flipping the normal if necessary. Uh, for example, for material point two in this figure there, uh, we have to flip the, the sign of the normal uh, to, to, uh, to assess that. And then there is another case where, and I forgot to mention this, this happens whenever the point projects to one of the rigid elements. So here, for example, this projects to this element, this point here projects to this element. But in some cases, the material points do not project to any element like this one here. In that particular case, yes, we calculate the normal as uh, the position uh, vector from one of the nodes uh, and basically the, the, the normalized vector of that. So once you have the normal detected and the correct value, so what we have is a material point like this. You can see here we have the radius of influence is penetrating the rigid body. So we have that distance is actually equal to the maximum distance between that inf uh, uh, circle and the rigid body. So then we use a penalty stiffness uh, to calculate the normal force. And that's basically this equation here. And so K is the stiffness of the material, V is the distance. So we have the normal force and then we calculate the tangent force uh, based on uh, a friction coefficient like so. And then the total the total force is just the addition of the two and then by Newton's law, the force on the material point is the negative of the force on uh, the rigid body. Now it's important to consider that this stiffness factor can be constant. Uh, that's what we initially use, but it's better if you use uh, something called uh, the barrier method that was proposed by Jean et al. And in this method, uh, the stiffness is actually a function of the distance phi sub p, as you can see, as you can see there. Okay, so that's gonna dictate the actual stiffness. Uh, sorry, this is a reference a stiffness there. So that value there is actually equal to the equation you see below that is used to ensure that there is no uh, instabilities related to the application of this method. And then this reduction factor here is also a function of distance, but uh, 
based on a approximation that's equal to 0 0.0281. So not, then uh, what I'm gonna do later is just to explore what's the effect of the stiffness based on changing this particular value here on the equation. So once we have the forces, what we do is that we pass that forces to the nodes based on this uh, interpolation that you see in the first equation there. Uh, and then finally, because you have that additional force, we add that to the linear momentum balance equation to solve for acceleration. So the acceleration field that you find accounts for the interactions between particles and rigid bodies. Uh, and then uh, what we can do to uh, for the rigid body is just so that you're gonna go very quickly here. We update the velocity and position of the rigid body uh, linearly, and but we can also update its rotation because we have all information regarding centroids and moments of inertia and things so we can also make the body rotate as well. Uh, so that's how um, basically it happens. Uh, so the other thing we also uh, were considering is cases where the velocity of the rigid body or the relative velocity of rigid body and material point is, is so high that the next time step, basically what can happen is that the point is gonna, it's gonna cross. And so if that tends to happen, what we do is we change the delta, the critical time step a little to prevent this situation. Uh, this is kind of an additional safety check for uh, preventing interpenetration of, of the points on the surfaces. So this is a, a comparison between Bardenhagen's uh, contact simulation and um, our method, but based on constant stiffness. And you can tell that there is some stability. That's why it doesn't uh, matches the, the actual movement uh, of the Bardenhagen's code. So you see that that's happening there. And you can tell, you can see in the right, it's not very clear, but that stability is observed here uh, at the beginning of of the motion. Uh, and so at the beginning, it's very kind of uh, looking similar to the analytical solution and Barton Hagen's uh, contact algorithm, but at the end, because of the instability, the, the block lags behind. And so these are the results when you implement the barrier method. That means the stiffness now is a function of distance. Uh, but in any case, what we were trying to see is what is the effect of this reduction factor on the stiffness uh, on the motion. So now we have, again, analytical solution, and uh, we have the Barton Hagen uh, solution as well. And you can tell that changing that reduction factor uh, by orders of magnitude doesn't affect the sliding uh, too much. So we were confident that just using uh, 0.0281 uh, doesn't change uh, things too much for the sliding process. Uh, so then after that, we were also looking at what's the effect of the radius of influence of the material point. And that to control that, we were basically changing the K factor on the radius of influence. And here there is a non-linear behavior because you can tell here that for K1, you really are far away from the solution. And then as you start decreasing the value, you get closer, but then you get, again, you uh, start separating uh, away from that solution. So there is kind of a, an optimum place where uh, about 0 0.5, it gets you as close as possible to the analytical solution, but still is lagging behind from the solution, from Barton Hagen. So it seems that there is a, a force that is in addition to uh, what it should be that prevents the, the, the body to move as it should. And so to uh, uh, account for that, what we basically were trying to do is, okay, what's that factor that once we change, uh, you know, change, we basically change the tangential force component to allow the body to move as it should. So as you can tell, it takes about 10% of reduction on the tangential force to get to the analytical solution. And uh, the reasoning behind this is that uh, once you pass the forces to uh, the nodes using the shape functions, that value is going to be actually a function of the position of the material point within the element. So that's going to dictate what's the force and that I think that the influence is what changes this a little bit uh, compared to the analytical solution. Well, I'm just going to show other examples here of use of this method. This is, uh, we're just trying to see if the, you know, like, different shapes will alter penetration processes. This is a V-shaped object uh, penetrating the 
to the elastic material. Now it's initially embedded into the soil and it's moving up, as you can tell there as well. Uh, uh, you can also use four close uh, envelopes, right? So that's, that's the case of a uh, ball refolding a ground, or you can simulate excavation processes and all. So as I mentioned before, um, uh, so we're gonna extend this to 3D. Uh, we also working on uh, capacity to determine tip resistance. That's important because now you don't have an area of, uh, of normal area, say, uh, acting here. So we're trying to see how we can incorporate that. We're gonna extend this for multi-phase materials. Currently it's only working for uh, the solid phase only. Um, so as a conclusion, we implemented a battery method for bidirectional thin rigid board interactions in Android 3D. Uh, we see that this is an alternative uh, to Bartenhagen. It's very easy to implement, uh, and it's very you don't need so many uh, iterations of models to get to a workable framework. And I think the battery method offers significant improvement over stiff only constant stiffness parameters, and but not all tangential forces using the penalty method are overestimating around 10% uh, of the original value. So thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm really happy to answer those. Thank you, Luis. Are there any questions? I have a question. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Uh, Luis, when you talk about this parameter, uh, like the tangential force correction and other correction, do you think that these numbers are project dependent? Uh, or... Yeah, I think I think it probably would be that's something that we're investigating. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it probably will be project. I think it, it depends also on, the, for example, if you have like in the case of the sliding, you all, you always have the way acting upon the surface, but in cases where the direction of the gravity is not acting there, probably that's not going to be the case. Um, so yeah, that's something that still on on the works. Thank you. If there are no more questions, we can move to the second presentation. Uh, right. um, thank you, Luis, again. And Maria Mandalari will be the, the next presentation, but another presenter has to, um, uh, to present before. So, Maria, it is okay for you? Yeah, yeah it's okay. Okay, good. So, the next speaker is Zayu Li from Tonji University. Please, uh, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Yeah, uh, could you see my uh, screen? Yes. Oh, thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, everyone. Okay. Let me start. Uh, could you see my presentation? We see the presenter mode. Yes, now it's okay. So maybe I can. Yeah, perfect now. Oh, yeah. This is normal now. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, let me start. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much for attending my presentation. My name is Li Zeyu, and my supervisor is Huang Huang Huang. I'm from Tongji University in in China, Shanghai. The uh, today the title of my report is Modeling of the Seepage Induce. Damage in water rich fault zone at tender phase by double point material point method. Uh, I will present my work from the following aspect. First, let's, let's start with the background. Tunnel phase uh, collapse is a common high risk accident in tunnel construction, according to an accident classic report. 42% of tunnel class uh, in incident occur at the tunnel phase. In recent years, tunnel phase collapse accidents have been frequently such as the uh, facing Grand Tunnel and the uh, Zhongjian Tunnel, uh, causing severe damage. Uh, tunnel excavation revealing fault is a significant trigger for tunneling collapse. Fort George, located at the, uh, at the core of the tunnel, has the lowest strength and its mechanical property control the instability and the collapse of the entire fault. When tunnel excavation exposed Port George, 
excavation disturbance and ground seepage significant weakening the original structure of the Fort George lead to a decrease in strength and increase its porosity. This study aimed to analyze the mecha uh, mechanical characteristic of Fort George and to model in the class collapse progress, a process of tunnel excavation, revealing water-rich fault zone using the material point method. In this procedure, liquid and solid coupling simulation are conducted to analyze the characteristic and mechanism of tunnel phase collapse and seepage. The second part, will, I will present the experimental result of Fort George and the purpose of constituting model. Uh, the Fort George from experimental was collected from the uh, Yunnan province in, uh, in China, located in the Honghe Fort Zone. The Pines Rock is milestone. Physical test measure the water content and the dis uh, destiny of the sample. XRD analysis revealing that the main co uh, component are quartz, feasible, and uh, clay minerals. We use uh, GDS tracks uh, opponents, consolidated drain tracks uh, share test were conducted on the Fort George. Uh, more uh, Mount moderate powder was added to alter its clay minerals content. The variable include water content, clay, and uh, confined pressure. A total of 18 tests that were designed covered six different conditions. And uh, the stress strain curves for part of the test are shown in the figure. It's a clean, uh, strain softening phenomenon observed as a confined pressure change and the high water content lead to a lower strain. The key data from the curve are present in the table. Uh, based on the model in Cambridge model, we extend the initial yield surface by introducing the degrees of cementation to consider the cohesion and the diligence strength effect of uh, cementation. This enabled us to develop a constitutive model for Fort George and consider the cementation. Um, in the constitutive model, we consider the effect of Pore change on um, permeability and cement based on the theory of saturated polymers media. We assume that saturated Fort George is composed only of rock skeleton and uh, uh, cementation materials and uh, groundwater. And uh, during uh, groundwater seepage, cementation material undergoes physical erosion and uh, chemical dissolution, weakening and uh, distinguish with where the rock skeleton deformed uh, uh, alter the pore structure of the Fort of the Fort George. The distinguished cement material space transform into seepage channel and uh, lead to a negative collection between the cementation and the permeability, both of which are influenced by porosity. Uh, and the permeability reflects the proposition and the geometry shape of seepage channel, where the cementation reflects the property and the strength of cement material. Consider uh, consider compare mutual transformation between cement material and the seepage channel based on the cousin karma in quotation. The relationship between permeability and the porosity is provided, and a similar re relationship between the cementation and the porosity is analogous uh, derived. Cons consider the weakening due to the worm tree yard. The actual formula of, uh, of the cementation chain is as follows. Based on the cementation constitutive model for Fort George, the experimental curves were fitted and the constitutive par parameter of different sample was uh, calibrated. And the third, uh, third part of the presentation was focused on our simulation for water-rich fault zone based on the fault constitutive model and the two-phase double point MP, uh, NPM. Uh, that is the uh, two-phase double point NPM basic theory, and uh, I think I, I don't need to uh, ex uh, introduce in here, and I will, uh, I will increase it. And uh, here is the uh, mass conservation and the moment conservation, and uh, the, uh, uh, the primary coupling between the solid and the liquid phase lies in the drag force. And uh, uh, some parameters are shown on the right are controlled by the organ formula and the Carson-Karman formula. 
And uh, based on the UBET function, I I coupling my uh my constitutive model into the annual three D and uh, there is an embedding progress the total stress and the total strain stress increment of material point was passed from a neural to the constitutive model and the stress increment were uh, are computed and uh, the permeability co coefficient was updated based on the change in porosity. Uh, relevant parameter will return to the neural and I construct uh. A model of tunnel excavation revealing a vertical water rich fault zone and uh, four different set of my uh, constitutive parameter were designed and uh, include uh, this four it uh, this uh, this four conditions and uh, there is uh, shows of the two phase, two phase double point npm and uh, uh Due to the same of high probability coefficient, same scale water inflow occur in the all different models. However, only the model were both scalar and the cementation were weakening, resulting in the tunnel phase collapse that uh, the black point is a uh, solid phase and the uh, and the blue point is a liquid a liquid phase. And uh, I extract a uh, solid phase deformation curve and the uh, infla influence range curve from different models. It evident that only the model was both scalar and the cementation were working together, resulting in a uh, rapid, rapid collapse, where others model only expect a minor larger deformation at the third phase. The extent of the liquid phase water inflow was uh, is significantly controlled by the probability coefficients with water inflow range being similar across the model. And uh, here is uh, some analysis about the solid and liquid uh, uh, their interactions. And during the collapse, the turn phase shortly after the uh, phase, uh, the fault zone was exposed and uh, stabilized up all, uh, after 2.5 seconds later. During this, progress the liquid phase flow was relatively slowly and uh, after 7.5 seconds the groundwater began to flow out from the front edge of the collapse mat with the flowing gra gradually increased by after 12.5 seconds some rock parameter will carry flow by the flowing water and uh, I select uh, uh, 150 material point with five meter behind the tunnel phase, and to extract the average change in porosity and the probability and the cementation degree during the class of pro uh, collapse progress, and showing the figure. During significantly deformation and the collapse, there was a redistribu redistribution of porosity with the within the fracture zone. With the rock scale and rotation and moved, the probability increased from 0 0.4 to 0 0.48. The probability increased threefold and uh, the cementation decreased to about one, uh, one third. Uh, finally, is the conclusion. And uh, most of the, the map about the experiment, and uh, I just read the last one embedding the four George cementation constitutive a constitutive model into the two phase double point NPM and to represent the stress 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 strain relationship of solid and liquid phase simulation, the progress of tunnel excavation revealing what's called water rich fault zone to determine the displacement characteristic of solid and liquid phase during collapse accident, as well as the effects of the local material parameter and the probability coefficient. Okay, thank you. That's all. Gaia, you're muted. Thank you, Kai. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You have a question. Um, the, the question is, tunnel phase instability involves zero or even negative pressure to very low mean stress soil state. So are your triaxial tests relevant or even able to establish um, apparent cohesion? And which soil cohesion did you use? So uh, I don't know 
what is that the soil cohesion soil uh please pardon uh, yeah i think I, that the question is about the fact that probably in the simulation you in some material points you get very uh, very low levels of stresses yeah uh, as occur in uh, problems of uh, tunnel phase instabilities and so this uh, uh, this person is asking is if you are considering some apparent cohesion and also in if maybe in your triaxial test uh, you consider very low level of stresses yes uh, because the uh, cohesion and uh, the um, friction angle is about uh, 30 kilo pascal or and the uh and the friction angle is about two uh, uh 20 degrees and uh, i transformed that uh, into my constituent model and it, yes that that is a very low degree of the cohesion and the friction angle and uh, maybe it's a little higher and uh, it just was the uh, water in rush but uh, without the tunnel collapse okay and uh, and also he asked can you cite the soil model you use and where to get the umat i don't know if your umat is available or uh that is available and uh, but i don't uh, send it into the uh, i just use it by myself and uh, if you need that uh, we can contact the uh, uh, in yes perfect i mean okay perfect yeah, we can yeah. contact you yeah, okay. Good. Are there more questions? I don't think so. Okay. Um, so let's move to the next presentation. The next thank speaker, you. thank you. The next speaker is Maria Mandalari from Mediterranean University of Reggio Calabria in Italy. Please, Maria, you can share your screen. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, can yes. you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. I am Maria Mandalari and I'm a PhD student at the Mediterranean University of Reggio Calabria. And my research is focused on the analysis of the impact force on a debris of debris flow on earth reinforced wall in order to examine the dynamics of the impact, evaluate the impact force evolution, and define the key parameters uh, affecting the impact. So I carried out a series of analyses using NPM in order to evaluate uh, the force of a fluid modeled with a Bingham constant. Bingham constitutive model on a rigid, rigid structure. So in order to solidify the investigation, I used uh, uh, the code to model an existing case study in the literature, which is the um, laboratory scale experiments per experiment performed by Song et al. in 2021. They employed a bilinear plume to study uh, the impact of debris flow on a rigid vertical barrier. They used uh, a volume of uh, 50 liter of uh, granular fluid uh, mixture composed by spherical glass beds and water. Uh, and they also me measured the total force thanks to um, some uh, uh, miniature load cells uh, which were applied on the rigid the vertical aluminum barrier. And they also uh, derived the frontal velocity prior to impact and the velocity flow uh, field during the impact thanks to high speed cameras. So uh, I uh, modeled the experiment with the NPM. Uh, I have to say that we decide to model only the impact phase and not the propagation phase. Thus, uh, the fluid is placed in front of the barrier and he, it uh, has a uniform velocity. Uh, so we investigated only the uh, dynamic of the impact. So we have to make uh, made appropriate uh, assumption regarding missing data, which were uh, bulk and young modules of the flow, inclination of flow front, and uh, velocity. And the barrier was modeled as a rigid body, while uh, the flow was modeled uh, with the uh, Bingham rheological model. 
So these uh, are the parameters that we use in the, in the model. For what it concerns the Bingham yield stress, we didn't know uh, the value. So uh, it is a parameter that affects especially the propagation phase, but uh, doesn't influence significantly the impact. So the, in the examined case, it is important to model properly the impact flow, but because of the design of the model and the length of the flow, this, there is a certain amount of propagation. So we carry out some tests in order to choose a stress value, which uh, would also allow the flow at the beginning of the channel. Uh, for what it concerns velocity, Song um, uh, reported two values of the velocity, uh, the, the first one at the impact and uh, at the second peak of the force. So we choose these two values and also a uh, uh, mean uh, value, uh, average value, which was 1.20 uh, meter per second. We didn't know the uh, characteristics of flow front, so on the basis of uh, observation of actual flows, we assumed that uh, the uh, inclination of the flow front was of uh, 25 and 30 grades. Lastly, uh, the final parameter to be defined was the bulk uh, modules. In the present case, as no specification were given in the article, uh, we made uh, an assessment on the basis of the solid volume concentration given uh, in the experiment and the different parameters of uh, the flow elements. This is an example of uh, um, the results of a simulation. We can see in the video that uh, the flow uh, impacts against the barrier. There is the formation of a vertical jet-like wave which falls back on itself, and then the formation of sequential waves due to the incoming flow. We can see that the height reached by the flow is uh, uh, 0.2 uh, meter, which, which matches the value reached in the experiments uh, by Song. Then I will present the um, uh, results of my parametric uh, analysis. In particular, the first case represented um, is uh, um, relative to the case where the velocity is 1.41 uh, meter per second. There is a bulk module of 4,266 uh, 4, kilopascal, and the flow front inclination is of 30 grade. Uh, from the graph in the slide, we can see that the first peak is slightly bigger than the value reached in the experiment, but the curves uh, um, matches well the trend uh, um, given by Song. In particular, uh, the fact that uh, the first peak is slightly higher uh, with respect to the one measured in the experiment is probably due to the fact that in the experiment, there is also the propagation phase. So particles arrive in front of the barrier with longer times <clears throat> compared to when the flow is uh, positioned in front of the barrier, which is uh, our case. Uh, another important aspect is the effect of velocity. Then, as I said before, we simulated three cases of velocity. And the first one, which was the case one, uh, which is the velocity at the impact, and, and the uh, other two cases of uh, uh, 0.99 meter per second, which is uh, the velocity of the flow at the second at the second peak, and a mean value of 1.20, which is the graph uh, at the right. We can see that a manual value of velocity captures well the first impact, but the second peak, which is this one, is uh, lower. While um, in the other case, um, the, the first peak is slightly higher with respect to the uh, curve given by Song, and also the second peak is lower with respect to um, the experimental case, while uh, but uh, the second curve matches well the trend of the curve given by Song, while the first case uh, in the first case the trend is shifted uh, downwards with respect to the uh, one uh, to the curve given by Song. 
We also analyzed the uh, effect of low front inclination. In fact, um, uh, in order to size well the first peak, it was considered a lower inclination of the forefront, but uh, which is the second graph. Uh, but it results that. Um, the simulation with a lower value of uh, floor front inclination results in a more irregular uh, trend. There is, uh, there is a good approximation of the second peak, while the first peak remains slightly higher with respect to the, to the one given, uh, given by Song. Another important aspect was the bulk modulus. In fact, uh, we considered also a case where uh, the bulk modulus was uh, uh, reduced uh, with respect to the first case and also increased. In particular, uh, we can see that for case 4 and 5, where the bulk modulus is uh, reduced, the first peak is always found to be higher uh, than the measure 1. Uh, then the major value, while the first trend is captured well, especially after the second peak. In particular, in uh, time between 2.5 and 3.5 uh, second section, the curve obtained with the MPM, with the MPM is shifted downward, downwards. While in the case of uh, an uh, increasing uh, value of, of bulk modulus, we uh, have a first peak, which is higher with respect to the one measured by Song, but we uh, also didn't reach, uh, um, don't reach the second peak. And also the trend of the curve didn't match uh, um, the uh, curve, the trend given by Song. So all simulation gives satisfactory results, but the best simulations are those four cases case one and case five, where whose parameter are shown in, um, in the slide. In both cases, the first section is overestimated compared with the results obtained from Song, while both in both simulation, the second peak and the following section are well captured. So, uh, my conclusions are that the simulation that best captures the first trend uh, recorded by Song and the second peak is the one with the, the velocity at the impact, which is 1.41 meters per second. If uh, we use high values of the back models, we didn't capture the first uh, development properly in the final uh, stretch, and there are too many fluctuations in the force. Under uh, the right assumption, MPM can compute quite correctly the impact force of a Bingham model flow on a rigid structure. And despite the simulation adopted, in fact, we didn't simulate the propagation, we can see that MPM, the essential aspect or, of the phenomenon, uh, are well captured when compared to the experimental data. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Maria. Um, are there any questions in the audience? No question? Uh, I have a curiosity. Um, in the smoothed course, <laughs> yes. Are, uh, are done by Excel, with, I mean, by elaborated data. MATLAB, yeah. But okay, okay. MATLAB so with it... the mean average value. Okay, so didn't come from a manipulation of the, no. of the code. Mm. Okay, thank you. If there are no more questions, we can pass to the, the last presentation. So the next speaker is Pietro Marveggio from Polytechnic University of Milan. Pietro, you can show your screen. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Well, it's, ah, it looks like it's frozen. Uh, sorry, I have to switch. I have to switch the screen. Uh,
Yeah. Now you should see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay. Thank Thank you so much for the for the introduction, Gaia. Uh, probably we are a bit late, so I'll try to be quick and get to the uh, let's say main point of my presentation. Actually, I want this to start from the title because my let's say the focus of my presentation it's the definition of a, a multi-phase, multi-regime model, which uh, well probably a few of you um, had the opportunity to follow the the first presentation of this morning. By, by Matteo Zerbi, he showed some results uh, that uh, were conducted, uh, with simulation conducted with this model, which is formulated in a multi-phase, multi-regime approach. Well, uh, multi-phase is quite uh, obvious, let's say. So it is, uh, it is a model which works uh, with different phases. Well, in that case, uh, we are just considering a saturated uh, granular soil. So the two phases are soil and water. While uh, it's a little bit more, well, it's worth mentioning and discussing a little bit what we mean with multi-regime. Actually, when we think about uh, granular materials, uh, we know that uh, actually like sand is kind of a magic material because it is able in just one quick transition to become a, a solid-like material or a fluid-like material. Uh, so this is quite obvious uh, if we think about uh, 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 these different processes uh, and different aspects of the, let's say, of the nature of the material itself. So we can we can have different regime which are associated to different behaviors. Okay. So the goal now is to try to reproduce the different regimes and also the transition. The challenging is to uh, describe and reproduce mechanically the transition between these two behaviors. Okay, uh, let's look at this quite simple video in which we see uh, an ideal granular material. So monodispersed uh, uh, spheres uh, which are sheared uh, underwater. So it's a it's a two phase, so multi phase material, in which we see that we have multi regime. So at the very bottom of, of the of the box, we have uh, a, a steel response. So it's uh, the so-called quasi-static response, meaning that uh, the system uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, is not flowing. Uh, let me say it uh, in a, in a simpli simplified way as it is. While we have the upper part in which we have grains which are not in permanent contact among each other and I and are colliding among each other. Okay, and in that case, we say that uh, it is another uh, totally different regime, which is a collisional regime. Okay, in between, we, if we focus in the the, the mid of the um, of the image, we see that we have a kind of tr transitional approach in which we have permanent contacts but also collisions. So it is quite important to uh, understand from a mechanical point of view what is happening in the material. I'm not uh, now looking at uh, water, which should be can be added later. But basically what we have is that on one side we have a quasi-static response, meaning that the system is can be seen and sketched as, a, as an assembly with uh, um, grains in a set of permanent force chains. Okay, so we have a network of... Uh, chains of contact, which is permanent and is not evolving quite fast in the over the time. On the other side, uh, on the other side, sorry, we have a system of colliding grains. So collisions are dominating the, the mechanical response. And we can imagine that we, we can pass from one state to the other and imagine that all these chains are broken suddenly. Okay. The other way around, of course, uh, if the collisional state is uh, cool down, let's say. So let's say the system is getting less agitated and less agitated. The permanent chains are got, are got back since uh, the network is a little bit more stable. Okay. Of course, then we have also to see what happens when we add this multi-regime approach water so that it becomes a multi-phase multi-regime. Um, so let's say that the water is switched off for now. The idea is to model these two mechanical behavior uh, in, a, in, a, in a combined way. So we have the collisional regime, which is described as a viscous response. So like, a, let's say, 
fluid, a Newtonian fluid. Of course, uh, the viscosity won't be constant, so it won't be a, a Newtonian material, but kind of, just to have a rough idea of that. On the other side, we have to describe uh, the force chains response, okay? And I did it by considering a simple elastoplastic, well, not simple, but starting from an elastoplastic response. So on one side, I have viscous response, time dependency, on the other side, no. Okay, and that, and then this is uh, uh, implemented into an Ura 3D. Uh, of course, uh, when you have to deal with, uh, uh, let's say, collisional response, uh, as we saw from the previous video, we have to consider large displacement. And so we need something which is a code which is capable of dealing with that. So without going into the details, uh, which you can find from, from, from the literature if you want, uh, the idea is that uh, to model the transition, we need uh, an elastoplastic law in which the critical state theory is uh, um, is uh, considered. Uh, and so, well, when we have the transition, actually, we, we imagine that we are approaching the critical state of the material, but we are also, let's say, getting uh, uh, when P prime goes to zero. Okay, so that is uh, so that is the transition itself. So we have to pass to the critical state to get to the transition. So uh, on the other side, uh, uh, to model the, the viscous response of collision, I use the kinetic theories of granular gases, which is uh, quite a, let's say, a complex uh, uh, mathematician, let's say, ma mathematic uh, uh, stress-strain relationship. But, but only, all in all, we can think about starting from ideal gases, where we know that we have a definition of the system of the agitation of the system, which is uh, actually the temperature itself. And then we have a law which is uh, giving a relationship between the pressure, so the stress state, and the state of agitation of the system, which is the temperature. If we scale this from ideal to granular materials, so we have to add inertia, of, of course, potentially we can also add friction and the fact that collisions are inelastic, it means that every time that we have a collision between two grains, we dissipate energy. We end up with a new definition of the temperature, which is called the granular temperature, okay? That is exactly the same definition of the molecular temperature, but in which we are accounting for the particle velocity, so the grain velocity, actually. So the idea is that the agitation is, is a measure of the, the difference between the, the, the average, sorry, of the difference between the particle velocity and the mean velocity, the velocity of, the, of the motion. We end up, let's say, with a scaled uh, version of the, the famous uh, relationship uh, for ideal gases. But all, and as we do for ideal gas, we need to add uh, the energy balance equation. Which is, a, which is working as a evolution law for, uh, for the, the, the temperature, okay? In that case, these are, uh, is not like, uh, like the real temperature, of course. So we, uh, we are considering uh, a, mechanical, a mechanical response in which we have work, which we input into the system. And we also have uh, uh, um, uh, Laplacian uh, uh, accounting for the distribution. So for the gradient of temperature, this will be crucial as we see later on. So let's think about let's um, studying the, the response of a of an ideal uh, uh, dry material sheared in a rheometer at a constant uh, volume. So I did it uh, with considering two D condition. Uh, so all in all, the the over the over um, the analysis which I run with Anura, um, in which is a modified version with respect to the to the one which is open source in which we have. Uh, the the temperature balance uh, equation, which is solved, as well as the linear momentum balance. The idea is that in this simulation, the volume must be constant all over the domain, but we have we can have uh, a non-homogeneous response uh, in the material, and that's what we got. Is uh, so starting from considering sorry different uh, uh, different velocity of motion. We see that uh, uh, we tend to compact the material at the closer to the inner zone in which the, 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 the boundary is fixed while we are moving the external part. Uh, and we see a dilation on the, on the, on the external ring. 
If we increase the velocity, this there is uh, this this aspect is even more uh, emphasized. So we see a higher dilation, which is balanced on a compaction in on the inside. Um, from a numerical perspective, we see that uh, there is a, a, let's say a smooth transition in in terms of agitation. It means that in the dilate in the part which is dilating. The system is more agitated uh, since the, the grains are less constrained and they can uh, collide to each other uh, quite a lot. Uh, and it, it's it worth mentioning that uh, if we run the same simulation without considering the gradient of the temperature, so without putting the Laplacian, we, uh, we see that uh, we tend to localize. So in that sense, this model is also capable of going beyond the limitation typical of uh, constitutive models, which have uh, the tendency to localize. OK, so that's that's very important. And that's a, a lesson that what you should keep in mind when you do numerical analysis. So when you put a Laplacian, everything will be smoother. So that's 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 always good. Let's go. Let's go briefly to the saturated version, so becoming from, say, from a multi-regime, we go to the multi-phase, multi-regime approach. Uh, the idea is to add uh, another uh, term to the stress tensor, uh, along uh, with uh, the quasi-static and the collisional uh, response, accounting for the leak. There is, uh, again, a sort of Newtonian response in which uh, we have to consider the presence of grains. So the viscosity won't be constant again, but will be function of uh, uh, the presence of the of the of the grains. So basically, it depends on the void ratio or porosity, and also the energy balance is modified. Okay, so when we imagine that the collision uh, take place without water, of course, during the free flight, there is no interaction between uh, the grain and some anything else. While we add, we put the the same collision into the into a water into liquid, we have that even during the free flight, actually there is a, a damping effect because of the presence of the water, and this tends to dissipate energy. Okay, of course we you you also have to consider drag into into that is playing a role into it, which is also a function of the porosity. Uh, to, to do this, uh, as uh, Matteo explained this morning, we went to con considering the two-phase double-point uh, formulation because we wanted to track separately liquid and uh, solid, and that has also an implication that I'll show you later. So I will now focus a little bit on the same, exactly the same problem that I addressed before, but in case of saturated response. Uh, and so, well, you see here the same the same simulation run at different velocity, uh, and this is uh, uh, all the plot are referring to the macroscopic variables. It means that uh, this is the 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 tau which is measured by the rheometer itself, which is of course uh, assuming uh, ideally that uh, uh, the system is uniform, but as we will see, this is not. Uh, and what we get is that uh, at steady we have a different uh, difference both in the in the evolution. So the faster we shear the material, the higher will be the the peak value of tau over sigma. Uh, and this is the the effective one. And what we get also at steady state is that uh, the higher we shear the material, the higher will be the limit value of tau that we get uh, at steady state. Uh, so when we look at uh, the um, the response, uh, in that let's focus now for the sake of brevity in terms of porosity, we see that again, uh, as as we saw in case of the uh, not saturated material, we have non-homogeneous uh, flow, uh, which is a, a quite um, emphasized in case of high higher shearing velocity. Uh, again, uh, the, the inner ring, which is fixed, uh, tends to, let's say, have a compacted uh, material, which is more or less steel, while outside the, the, the outer ring is colliding and is moving faster, dissipating most of the energy. So just a, a quick focus, uh, going back to Matteo's presentation, then, I, then I'm going to the conclusion of, the, of my presentation. 
uh, this is this is very nice uh, and also I think can be linked more or less with uh, what was discussed before using Bingham Bingham model. Uh, during uh, during an impact of saturated granular mass on, in this case, a rigid obstacle, but um, I mean, it's quite general, we see that most of the response, uh, considering this, uh, let's say, complex uh, approach in which we can separate from uh, liquid and solid contribution, we see that more or less most of the contribution is due to the liquid itself, not to the solid one. So probably that's why for Bingham approach, uh, the uh, shear limit value is not playing so um, large role uh, in the in the impact because that part is more or less related to the to the ideally to the solid contribution, uh, and this is then this is mean it means that uh, um, when we change the porosity of the of the fluid oh sorry of the of the mass uh, basically the the core of the of the effect of, on, on, on the force, on, on the impact force, is due to the liquid contribution, which is changing a little bit, but not so much, while there is a, a small variation which is, which is associated to the presence of the solid contribution, which is not dominating, okay? So this is also quite interesting uh, when we have to compare dry uh, granular avalanches over saturated ones. Just to conclude, to conclude, I wanted to uh, point it out uh, the effect of uh, phase separation, which which can be easily and, and it's nice to see here uh, with a double point formulation in which we have we can we can put in evidence uh, clearly the 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 liquid uh, separation uh, with respect to the solid material when we start from loose condition. Uh, and this is also something that is seen experimentally. So it means that, uh, I mean, this approach is quite uh, robust and can reproduce quite well uh, also the, the mechanics uh, behind uh, all this, uh, all this uh, fluid uh, and solid uh, interaction in, uh, in case of multi-phase and multi-regime approach, such as uh, impact of uh, granular materials over rigid obstacles. Uh, with that, uh, I conclude. Uh, I try to be as quick as possible. No, I hope that uh, more or less everything is clear, at least the idea. Here uh, you have a few references. Uh, well, if you have any question, please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Pietro. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, I had a question. That second to last slide you showed that had the liquid and solid phases from an experiment, I think. Uh, what? Yeah. Let me. You mean this one? Yeah. What is that that we're seeing in the image on the right? Oh yeah, that's that's basically an experimental uh, submerged uh, impact. So sorry, not submerged, but uh, saturated impact, uh, which was experimentally. Uh, simulated. Uh, uh, this one, I think it was at 1G, but uh, there, is, there are also results uh, run in the centrifuge. And what we see here that there is a separation of the water level, the, the, the water surface, which is the blue line, and the red line, which is the solid one. So what happens is that during the impact, uh, we have the a change in porosity, which is when and then when the material is uh, sufficiently permeable, let's say, uh, it's also associated to uh, water which is expelled from the porous of the of the material. So yeah, this is something which is quite uh, commonly seen uh, also during uh, avalanches. And, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, um, I think we can move on to the to the closing. So thanks to all the presenters in this session for the interesting presentations. So I'm, I'm going to share some slides to announce the, the upcoming events organized by the Anula 3D group.
Yeah, can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay. Thanks, Gaia. All right, so I'll talk briefly about the NPM workshop and another three D short course that we have coming up this fall. So the fifth and sixth of September at UC Berkeley will be the fifteenth annual NPM workshop. So we do this um, pretty much every year in the U.S. There's still time to register. I think I have.